Hi and good evening to all the students. How are you guys? I hope all of you are doing well. I'm um, Dr. Akshay, as all of you can remember. And uh, if you all can hear me well, then uh, <clears throat> I think we can start this session. So before actually starting this session, let me tell you the purpose. The purpose of this session is to make sure that now about 21 days before your examination, we are able to see all the important and relevant images from the examination point of view. So I have purposely not kept a 25 most important question kind of session. I have purposely kept an image based revision session and uh, I will try to be precise and try to be concise as well and make sure that it comprehensively covers all the important topics as far as orthopedics, some part of anatomy and radiology also as far as your examinations are concerned. So, uh, this is not going to be just uh, 25 questions and discussion on 25 topics. It's quite an elaborate thing. I think all of you must have received a PDF from the, uh, the MIST office also. So, uh, let's start. And uh, I've actually segregated these images in terms of the important topics from examination point of view. So, the first part uh, of discussion will be the general orthopedics trauma, it is basically more or less based upon how we studied in the classes uh, in the workbook, which has been oriented and given by Miss to all of you. So it's going to be the revision almost on the same pattern with all important images, which include uh, X-rays, MRIs and clinical images from examination point of view. Friends, I expect all of you to concentrate for the next, uh, I think, four, four and a half hours for this class and do feel free to basically write any comment or uh, you know anything which you are not able to understand. Most of you have my phone number for contact. So if you're not able to understand anything in the PDF, feel free to basically ask uh, uh, you know after the class today or even tomorrow whenever you guys get time. So let's start. And uh, as I told you, it is oriented in absolutely the same way as our workbook, which has been given by MIST. So general orthopedics, polytrauma, metabolic bone diseases, and then we move towards systemic things like infections and, you know, tumors and arthritis and other things. Okay. So all set and let's go. So the first uh, <clears throat> image is an X-ray. And uh, this X-ray, as all of you can see, is a forearm AP and uh, lateral X-ray from a child who is skeletally immature. Why I say? Because I can see epiphysis. I can see metaphysis and I can see diaphysis. So first thing in an examination, if you have an X-ray, look at whether the growth plate, which in this case is visible between epi and metaphysis is open or closed. Open means skeletally immature patient. So yes, so what is the finding? And we'll concentrate only uh, on the finding as far as this examination, this uh, session is concerned. So all of you can see a fracture in the radius partial which one cortex is broken other is bent this is a classical pattern which is seen in skeletally immature patients when they fall down or sustain a trauma and these kind of incomplete fractures are called as green stick fractures these are called as green stick fractures or incomplete fractures Just remember, for you to actually diagnose a green stick fracture, the X-ray should show predominantly open growth plate, skeletally immature patient. Okay. Now, the second X-ray is uh, an X-ray of the hand. We can take AP and oblique view. So, I've just put one view here. And the encircled box which shows here is a fracture of which part? So, first ray is the thumb. And the fifth ray is the little finger. So fracture of the neck, fracture of the neck in a metacarpal or a phalanx, the nomenclature or the description of the bone is head, neck, shaft and base. These are the four predominant parts in terms of how we describe an area. So this x-ray shows a fracture of the neck of the fifth metacarpal 
fracture of the neck of the fifth metacarpal and we have already discussed in this class when we were doing orthopedics that this is an x this is a kind of injury produced when you punch with force a firm surface like a wall which is why this pattern of fracture is what is called as boxer's fracture this is called as boxer's fracture i'm getting great responses from all of you so continue this continue this continue this this is a classical x-ray of a fracture neck of fifth metacarpal of the hand also called as boxer's fracture okay the next x-ray again we first see the x-ray which part this is beta the knee region this is the knee so this is femur this is your tibia and this is your fibula and what it shows also very very clearly are the areas of epiphysis areas of metaphysis and you can see here impression of the growth plate on both the sides which means skeletally immature patient so when young children skeletally immature they fall down and sustain a trauma which also affects or injures the growth plate then these injuries of uh, the growth plate are classified by a classification given by two gentlemen it's called as salter and harris classification salter and harris classification of epiphyseal injuries and as we discussed in the class also salter and harris classification of epiphyseal injuries predominantly of five types in which just type one is just you know there is uh, separation of the epiphysis from the metaphysis what we call as physial separation type 2 is what we can see here on the x-ray so there is a physial separation this is the area where the separation is taking place but what is happening here that in the separated fragment you can see an area of the metaphysis an area of that metaphysis a beak of metaphysis so this is described or this has been described by Salter and Harris as what kind of injury? This is type 2 injury pattern, type 2 which is described as injury of the physis or the growth plate along with a fracture in the region of metaphysis. fracture in the region of metaphysis as all of you can see this is the metaphyseal fracture and this beak of metaphysis what beak this beak of metaphysis which all of you can see which is attached on the separated fragment produces a classical sign on an x-ray which is what is called as i think some people have already written this this is called as thurston holland sign thurston holland sign some books also mention this as a shiny corner sign but i think thurston holland sign is a good way to remember classically seen in type 2 salter and harris epiphyseal injury pattern type 2 so this metaphyseal beak produces a sign called as thurston holland sign another question which can come from salter and harris <laughs> kind of injury is a classical example of type 4 so type 1 we have discussed is a physial separation type 2 is a separation along with a fracture of metaphysis type 3 as some person is asking beta this is not type 3 type 3 is an injury of the growth plate and along with this there is a fracture which involves the epiphysis type 4 is when all the three are involved so there is a line which crosses and involves epiphysis physis and metaphysis classical example of type 4 is a lateral condyle fracture of humerus in children we'll see i put an x-ray there also we'll see that so just remember these are the two important questions from this concept type 2 injury which produces a thurston and holland sign and type 4 injury pattern which is classically seen in children with lateral condyle fracture of humerus and here it comes this is a classical x-ray of a lateral condyle why am i saying this lateral so aap ko, what have you, what are you supposed to see in the examination you will see a humerus you will see ulna and radius correct radius means that this is the lateral part ulna means this is your medial part of the forearm so 
you can all see a fracture which is involving the epiphysis, physis and metaphysis with a separated fragment. This is a classical x-ray of fracture of lateral condyle of humerus. Remember this? Fracture of the lateral condyle of the humerus, which is an example of Salter and Harris type 4 injury pattern. Type 4. And what is type 4? Quickly, involvement of physis plus there is a fracture of metaphysis. And along with this, there is a fracture of epi. Physis. Remember this type 4 is involvement of all three. So epiphysis, growth plate, and metaphysis, all of them are involved. Some important points about this fracture, which all of you can remember, is the examination that yes, it is an example of type 4 Salter and Harris injury pattern. Other important points which are there is the important complication. So you know this is a fracture of necessity. So you treat lateral condyle fracture in children by fixing it. That's why it's called as a fracture of necessity. If you don't fix it properly, if the fracture does not unite, so it's very commonly seen non-union. Other complication, because of the growth arrest on the lateral column as a growth plate is injured, it produces what complications? A cubitus valgus deformity. That's one. Remember this, I'll, I'll discuss uh, cubitus valgus and varus also, so no need to worry. A cubitus uh, valgus deformity and because of the progressively increasing valgus in this fracture pattern, so till the child keeps on growing, growing till skeletal maturity, the valgus increases and so does the stretch on the ulnar nerve which passes just as you know behind this uh, medial epicondyle and this causes you know, stretch on the ulnar nerve and what is classically called as a tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So these are the important complications apart from non-union. It can cause a cubitus valgus and a tardy ulnar nerve palsy. <clears throat> okay, good. So these are the important points. We move towards the <laughs> next x-ray and uh, this is an x-ray from the foot AP, anterior posterior view and what I want all of you to focus here is look at the second metatarsal of the foot, second metatarsal of the foot and normally in some of the, you know, people who are predominantly what? Who are long distance marathon runners. Long distance marathon runners army recruits who keep on stamping their foot when they are practicing. Sometimes because of this constant stress on the foot, it de they develop a small linear crack in the bone, small bones like metatarsal of the foot. So these are basically stress fractures of the foot. This is the stress fracture of the region of the foot which is also called as what fracture? Yes, I think some people have written this. This is also called as March fracture. Very good. March fracture. Most common site for March fracture is second metatarsal of the foot. Second metatarsal of the foot. So stress fractures can be seen in various regions. It can be seen in neck of the femur. It can be seen in neck of the scapula. It can be seen in the pubic rami. So areas of stress. But specialized kind of stress fracture which is seen in the foot as you can see in you know, athletes who are constantly running, marathon runners, army recruits, dancers, they can develop this foot pain and when you, you, know, you do an investigation you find that they have developed a fracture, these are called as March fractures. Remember that the investigation of choice not for March fracture but for any kind of stress fracture in the body is a magnetic resonance imaging scan or an MRI scan. So this is the very important uh, point which I want all of you to remember is that the investigation of choice for all kinds of stress fractures are MRI scans. <clears throat> okay, 
Now this is a simple x-ray for a, a hip joint. As all of you can see, hip is what kind of a joint? Ball and a socket joint. So you can see this is the socket, what is called as acetabulum, in which ideally there should be head of the femur. In this case, sorry, I think, yeah. In this case, the head of the femur is out of the socket. This is an x-ray classically of what? Posterior hip dislocation. This is posterior hip dislocation which is by the way the most common type of hip dislocation that's number one it is also called as dashboard injury it is also called as dashboard injury and <laughs> The attitude with which the patient presents to the hospital after a posterior hip dislocation is that of flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So this is what all of you have to remember for your examinations. This is a classical attitude of a patient who has got a posterior hip dislocation. And we got to reduce all the joints in the body as promptly as possible so as to reduce any chances of neurovascular injury. Most common complication, most common complication of a posterior hip dislocation if it is not reduced promptly is an injury to sciatic nerve. So sciatic nerve palsy or injury is what it can produce which clinically we as doctors while we are examining the patients so patient who has got a flexed adducted and internally rotated attitude and we think that the patient has a posterior dislocation we must always check what we must always check whether the patient has a proper ankle dorsiflexion or not because when there's a, there is an associated sciatic nerve injury patients can present with to you with a classical foot drop deformity foot drop so most common complication of a posterior hip dislocation is an injury to the sciatic nerve which runs right posterior to the hip joint head of the femur rather and it can manifest itself as a foot drop deformity in the patient so remember these important points for this now two x-rays i've put here are from the shoulder joint one on the left classically is anterior shoulder dislocation anterior shoulder dislocation and if you remember what we discussed in the class anterior shoulder dislocation is the most common type of shoulder dislocation okay that's number one very important when the patient presents or comes to us <coughs> to the hospital and to us he comes with an attitude on the affected side, which is that of flexion, abduction, plus external rotation. Rather, you can, I think you can omit this flexion word. You can just remember, this is abduction and external rotation. So these are, I think, two important words which you can remember. Abduction and external rotation are the important uh, uh, you know, it's how the patient presents. So, abducted and externally rotated. So that the patient actually comes with the injured hand, they hold with the opposite hand and come. So, abducted, externally rotated attitude of the injured side. Okay. So, we have to reduce this. Now, <clears throat> more importantly, there is another kind, although rare, in which the head of the humerus goes posterior to the glenoid, this is called as posterior shoulder dislocation. Posterior shoulder dislocation, posterior. And if I can just zoom this image, all of you will see that this is an image in which the head of the humerus has gone behind. So that's an oh, there is an overlap here. And because it goes posterior, it rotates internally. So it starts, the head starts appearing like a bulb, a bulb. So you can see this, something like this, which is why 
the x-ray of posterior shoulder dislocation classically produces so the x-ray produces a sign which is called as light bulb sign that's number one the attitude of the patient i mean attitude of the injured extremity is that of adduction and internal rotation adduction and internal rotation adduction and internal rotation and finally where do you want to suspect this so what can what has come in the examinations a patient on long term phenytoin or barbiturate therapy means a patient who has epilepsy or seizures so when they inadvertently fall down they tend to actually uh, you know sustain a force which pushes the head of the humerus back so very commonly seen in patients who are epileptic so epilepsy and electrocution so two important causes of a posterior hip dislocation happening in a patient so these are important points about shoulder dislocation anterior is the most common posterior is rare and uh, this is how uh, you manage and as all of you have written a uh, close reduction is ideally the treatment of choice which is ideally done under some kind of sedation and you know that this is an area where axillary nerve is very very close it just passes behind the head of the humerus and the neck so when it's there's a lot of stretch it can produce an axillary nerve impairment which can manifest itself at what sign a regimental badge sign and also sometimes in severe cases paralysis of the deltoid muscle deltoid muscle okay now we move towards the next x ray which is an x ray of the elbow joint this is and sorry this is anterior posterior and this is lateral view now what i want to show here to all of you that sometimes you can get x rays in the examination with this extra kind of bone formation you know extra kind of bone formation this is very very commonly seen around the elbow and what is this is termed as is this is called as myositis ossificans myositis ossificans and myositis ossificans is most commonly seen in supracondylar fracture of the humerus around the elbow so when some of the children they fall down and they de they develop this supracondylar fracture we'll talk about this and they you know uh, somewhere at home or somewhere in the local clinics there's a lot of massaging it has been seen that it causes calcification of the hematoma inside a muscle so supracondylar fracture is very very importantly the reason which is seen around the elbow the most common muscle which develops a myositis mass is the brachialis muscle brachialis muscle brachialis muscle and uh, so this is this extra bone formation is something what you all should remember elbow is very notorious for even in the hip joint you can see this myositis mass getting formed especially if there is a head injury associated also so around the hip when there is a head injury patient and around the elbow especially in case of supracondylar fracture of the humerus okay now we move down towards the hand x rays once again and i put these two x rays for all of you for which joint i told you in the class also this is a very important joint functionally a joint which is seen between the first metacarpal which is the metacarpal of the thumb along with the carpal bone which is the trapezium so trapezio metacarpal joint is also called as what joint the first carpo metacarpal joint the first carpo metacarpal joint also called as trapezio metacarpal joint trapezio metacarpal joint and there are two important injuries which all of you should know how to be identify in the examination and i put both these x rays so that you can see is the first cmc joint uh, things 
so okay the first one we'll concentrate so the first one is definitely a fracture which is going so fracture of the base of the first metacarpal and we can see that the, this joint the first cmc joint has lost its congruency lost its congruency while the second x-ray shows the fracture of the base of the first metacarpal but the first carpometacarpal joint is congruent or intact so depending upon whether the joint is subluxated or incongruent there are two pattern of fractures of the first metacarpal base which have been described the first one is what is called as bennett's fracture dislocation bennett's fracture dislocation which is actually an intra articular fracture of the first metacarpal base intra articular fracture of the first metacarpal base and along with this there is dislocation or subluxation of the first carpo metacarpal joint that is bennett's fracture dislocation the second x-ray shows just the fracture of the first metacarpal base but no associated subluxation or dislocation but the joint is intact the first cmc joint and this injury pattern friends is what is called as rolando's fracture this is called as rolando's fracture both these fractures are important but yes when there is a subluxation or the dislocation then it needs to be reduced and fixed so this is a rolando's fracture now so first thing all of you should know how to differentiate between these two type of injuries second rolando is okay this may come as an image based question but bennett has come in certain types so bennett's fracture dislocation one thing is an image based identification the second thing which comes from bennett's i told you in the class also is that <clears throat> what is the deforming force so this the shaft fragment is pulled laterally the shaft fragment after the fracture is pulled laterally by the forces of abductor pollicis longus which does not allow the joint to remain congruent so this is the reason why because the shaft is constantly pulled laterally this is exactly the reason why we are not able to uh you know get this congruency maintained or restored conservatively in a bennett's fracture dislocation okay so just remember these two important points and these two patterns of first cmc joint injuries okay i think a question which came in the last examination this is the classic most common elbow injury amongst children a fracture in the region of metaphyses of distal humerus supra condylar fracture of the humerus supra condylar fracture of the humerus matlab supra matlab above and condyles are the medial and the lateral condyles so supra condylar fracture is a fracture above the condyles of the humerus in the distal metaphysis area so when the child falls down on an outstretched hand while playing or while walking this is the most common elbow injury which takes place in young children this is the most common and there are some very very important points which all of you should remember for this and this is one of the most fancy topics in your examination from which so many questions uh, you know come in the examination from on all kinds of examinations so pehla cheez most common pediatric elbow trauma yes supracondylar fracture where do you see this in children between 5 to 8 years of age yes or no most common fracture associated with vascular injury remember this this is the most common fracture which is associated with vascular injury and this is a question which has also come previously which vessel it is the injury to brachial artery which happens it is the injury to brachial artery apart from this sometimes these fractures not only vessel but can they also involve the nerve which is there so most common nerve injured 
in supracondylar fracture humerus. The precise answer for this is anterior interosseous nerve. Anterior interosseous nerve. If you can't find AIN in the answer, you know what is anterior interosseous nerve? It's a pure motor nerve of the anterior aspect of the forearm. Yes or no? Supplying the deep muscles. If you can't find anterior interosseous nerve, then yes, median nerve is the next best answer. It's the next best answer. Now, <clears throat> so we normally, you know, either we do close reduction or plaster of Paris or we just fix. There are some important complications which can take place. So it can be immediate, early and late complications. I will obviously not go into detail about all these things. But one important complication is a malunion of these fractures. Malunion. Malunion of these fractures which leads to a classical cubitus varus deformity. A cubitus varus. We will discuss about cubitus varus, uh, uh, genu varus, and coxa varus today also <clears throat> in this uh, this uh, revision class. It leads to a cubitus varus. Varus matlab the forearm part has drifted towards midline with respect to the long axis of the arm. So cubitus varus, which because it resembles a long barrel gun, also called as gun stock deformity. Also called as what deformity? Gun stock deformity. Gun stock deformity. So malunion of the supra. And why does this malunion take place, friends? This malunion take place because I told you, you remember any, you know, there are so many displacements, but two important displacements which you have to remember in supracondylar fracture, posterior and medial. So it is that medial displacement of the distal fragment if left uncorrected in a plaster. So, if you are not able to do close reduction properly, if it remains persistently medially displaced and internally rotated, produces a classical cubitus varus or gun stock deformity. As somebody is asking, sir, it is a functional, it is not a functionally limiting deformity, beta. it is a cosmetic deformity. But yes, patients do come to us to get it functionally corrected because it does not look nice. So, it is not a functionally limiting or a disabling deformity, but yes, it is a cosmetic deformity, gun stock deformity. <clears throat> okay, next x-ray, next x-ray uh, is an x-ray of the, how do you read this, x-ray of the elbow with the forearm, yes or no? X-ray of the elbow with the forearm on the left anterior posterior on the right a lateral view and we can see here two things what are the two things a fracture of the proximal part of the ulna so the upper part of the ulna shaft fracture along with dislocation of the head of the radius what is this injury called as so fracture of the proximal one third of the ulna shaft the fracture of the proximal one third of the shaft of the ulna along with radial head dislocation again one of the injuries which I told you in the class is also called as fracture of necessity this because it needs surgical fixation this is what is called as Montegia this is called as Montegia fracture dislocation this is called as Montegia fracture dislocation this is called as Montegia fracture dislocation so Fracture of the proximal thirds of ulna along with radial head dislocation, Montegia fracture dislocation. Okay. Now, better next we come to another uh, important uh, fractures. Now, or um, I have put, uh, you know, intentionally I put it like this, not straight, because I wanted all of you to realize. Look at this. This is what this is an X-ray of the forearm. So these are the forearm bones, radius and ulna. This is the lateral view. These are your carpal bones and these are your metacarpal bones. Okay, so this is your this is your lateral view and this is your anterior posterior view. And what all of you can see here, a fracture of the distal radius not involving the joint. 
नॉट इन्वॉल्विंग द ज्वाइंट मतलब एक्स्ट्रा आर्टिकुलर वॉट काइंड एक्स्ट्रा आर्टिकुलर extra means outside articular means joint so the fracture of the distal radius not involving the joint or extra articular fracture of the distal radius most commonly is what is seen in clinical practice yes what is this called as this is called as colis fracture yes or no colis fracture colis fracture typically is produced in elderly females more than 45 to 50 years osteoporotic and female more common than males so this is the colis fracture a fracture of the distal end of the radius which is seen very commonly in elderly osteoporotic patients and when they fall down conventionally not always but conventionally when they fall down what all of you can see here look at this distal fragment can all of you see that till the fracture site it is absolutely linear and once the fracture takes place the distal fragment tilts posteriorly or dorsally which when this fracture mal unites or does not so if you apply a plaster without correcting the displacement this posterior displacement this is how it joins so this is how it joins so this is your forearm bones this is your posterior displacement and then this is the rest of the hand it mimics what is called as a dinner fork which is why colis fracture produces a classical dinner fork deformity and this dinner fork deformity is because of posterior posterior displacement of the distal fragment this is because of posterior displacement of the distal fragment now colis fracture normally we treat just by giving a cast i have a picture of the plaster also i will show you just remember like other fractures colis fracture also can produce a lot of complications yes or not can produce a lot of complications there are few questions which have been asked all of us remember so much about dinner fork deformity that we tend to forget the important parts most common complication most common complication of this colis fracture is what is called as finger stiffness finger stiffness the most common complication of colis fracture is finger so when we reduce and put them in a plaster these elderly patients once we take out the plaster we see a lot of stiffness in the wrist hand and the fingers in these patients which is why although malunions are seen don't forget the most common complication is not a dinner fork deformity is a stiffness in the fingers and the hand which is most commonly seen okay okay now the next set of x ray and clinical picture again as one of the late complications of colis fracture are this what you can see on an x ray so what do you see here on an x ray multiple areas of the bones which show that the bone is resorbed yes or no when you clinically examine look at the difference look at how the affected side is swollen the skin is tense and shiny this is classically what is called as pseudex osteo dystrophy why because this was first described by sudek then the name changed and it was called as rsd rsd is reflex sympathetic dystrophy the name which is nowadays used for all these things is crps which stands as complex regional complex regional pain syndrome complex regional pain syndrome or crps i will not go into details about these things just that a patient who has been treated with colis fracture a patient who has been treated with colis fracture even in a cast at the time of removal sometimes can show you severe swelling tenseness and shiny skin when you take x rays of this patient it shows so this is again an important thing an x ray to identify in the examination x ray shows areas of localized or 
patchy absorption of the bones, so osteoporosis. And RSD is basically of two types, type 1 and type 2. Just remember that Coley's fracture produces RSD type 1. RSD type 1. So type 1, complex regional pain syndrome or RSD is what is seen most commonly after Coley's fracture. It can be seen in other fractures also, but most commonly it is seen after Coley's fracture. Coley's fracture. Okay, a few x-rays I think from the spine also I have put here. So, as all of you, and this is, I think, we discussed in the class also. This is an injury which involves an area of C2 and C3. So, first described in judicial hanging, nowadays seen most commonly in high-velocity road traffic accidents. So, this injury is, it is a traumatic dislocation of the C2 over C3, a traumatic dislocation of the second cervical vertebra over the third, when this is associated with fracture of the second cervical vertebra, this pattern of injury as some people have already written here, what is this called as? This is called as hangman's fracture. <clears throat> this is called as hangman's fracture. And although first described in judicial hanging, the most common cause of hangman's fracture, high velocity road traffic accident. High velocity road traffic accident is the most common common cause. Just remember this. Okay. Now, I've put a few of the fixation devices now. So, I have discussed in the class with you that when there is an injury, it can be fixed both internally and externally. So, these are some pictures of external fixators. This is an external fixation device with shan spin and rods. So, it's a unilateral, uniplanar external fixator. And to a few students, I also showed the clinical pics of how we do external fixation as far as the fractures when we are in the operation theatres and we have to do this. So this is external fixator, which can be, you know, like this. We have some, you can see a lot of these pins which are going inside. These are called the shan pins and they are connected by a lot of tubular rods which are seen. So they are good uh, for uh, fixation of, uh, you know, high velocity injuries which are associated with significant soft tissue disruption sometimes. They can also be circular or ring external fixators, as you can see in the other things. So, this is a classical circular ring fixator, which is called as Elizarov's external fixator. Remember Elizarov's external fixator? I showed you put rings and along with these rings, they are connected with rods and you can, you can do any kind of deformity correction. You can do limb lengthening. You can do it in non-unions and other things also, Elizarov. Of all these external fixation devices which are put for managing trauma patients, there is a limitation of why we can't put them too much because the most common complication of external fixators when used in clinical practice is the presence of pin site or pin tract infections. So when used for a long time, they can cause pin site or pin tract infections. <clears throat> That's one thing. So that limits the use of these external fixator devices for a long duration of time because they are coming from outside and going inside the body. Very high chances then there can be pin site infections, loosening and other things which can take place, which is why we uh, use them, but we use them only in specific indications only. Specific indications only. Now, <clears throat> I will not go into detail like this, you know, as in this class, but just that the Elizarov's external fixator is also used, as I discussed in the class, for the purposes of limb lengthening. So when you have a short limb and you want to increase, you know, the, uh, the length of that extremity. So limb lengthening is what is sometimes being done in Elizarov's external fixator. So the principle on which the limb lengthening is based when we use Elizarov is what is called as distraction 
osteogenesis so controlled distraction followed by bone formation osteo means bone and genesis is formation is the principle on which the limb lending is based by the use of Elizarov's external fixator Elizarov's external fixator okay very good now we move towards the next sli group slide and uh, you know two important things which I wanted to put all of you so <clears throat> on the left is a kacha plaster so what is us called as a U slab slab is for temporary stabilization and on the right is definitive treatment for fractures of the shaft of the humerus by the use of this type of cast called as hanging cast which extends from the axilla to the metacarpophalangeal joint as you can see both of these are used for fractures of uh, shaft of the humerus so both of these are used for management of what fracture sorry for fractures of the sh shaft of the humerus so u slab is used for temporary stabilization hanging cast is used for permanent treatment for fracture shaft of the humerus just to uh, this was these are the diagrams which i wanted all of you to be able to identify in the examination you all of you know that when there is a fracture shaft of the humerus the most common nerve involved or can get injured in this is which nerve radial nerve isn't it radial nerve and this can produce a classical wrist drop we will see this wrist drop deformity because of the paralysis of the wrist extensors which are basically ECRL and ECRB. So extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis paralysis can produce a classical wrist drop deformity. Wrist drop deformity can produce a classical wrist drop deformity. Okay. <clears throat> now we move towards the next x ray, and this is again one another fracture of necessity which is in the scene in the fracture dislocations in the forearm so you see here one fracture and you see a opening of the distal radio ulnar joint so when you have an injury in the forearm when you have an injury in the forearm in which there is a fracture of the distal shaft of radius fracture of the distal shaft of the radius along with injury of the DRUJ which is the distal radio ulnar joint this is again a fracture of necessity and what is this called as beta this is called as Galeazzi fracture dislocation this is called as Galeazzi fracture dislocation this is another a uh, very important fracture of necessity. I'm saying these fractures of necessity are the fractures who need, which needs to be surgically treated and fixed so as to avoid complications. So we know now three, lateral condyle fracture of the humerus, Montegia fracture dislocation, and Galeazzi fracture dislocation. Add one more to the list in the lower limbs, fracture neck of the femur, and these four important fractures constitute the list of fractures of necessity. Okay. The next important X-ray from uh, our examination point of view is very commonly seen in athletes or even in common public when they are walking and they have the sudden twisting injury. In the foot, as all of you can see here, AP and oblique X-ray of the foot, a fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal of the foot. The fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal of the foot and the fifth metatarsal fractures are basically divided into zone 1, zone 2 and zone 3. For FMG, I will not go into details about three, these three zones, but just you can remember a classical zone 2 base of the fifth metatarsal fracture as all of you can see here on the x-ray is called as Jones fracture. This is called as Jones fracture. 
very commonly seen in athletes you know so when they are practicing and they have sudden twisting injury and this is that peroneus brevis tendon which keeps on pulling this uh, fragment and does not allow it to remain in its place this is a extremely important fracture identification from examination point of view is jones fracture okay now next <coughs> image is a CT scan. This is a CT scan and why do we say a computed tomography film? Because you can see the bones very clearly. And which region? This is the region of C1, C2. Why? Because you can see this odontoid process. Odontoid. So C1 and C2 injuries are quite commonly seen in clinical practice. One such injury is what you see when you see fracture of the arch of the C1 or the atlas vertebra, fracture of the arch of C1 or atlas which is called as Jefferson's fracture. This is called as Jefferson's fracture. So CT is the best thing to see otherwise if you don't have the facility of a CT an open mouth view can also be done to actually see whether there is a fracture or not. So you can see an odontoid film here you can see the body this is better the body of C1 this is the body of C1 and these processes are which are called are called as arch of C1 there are four arches two anterior two posterior arch fracture this is classical Jefferson's fracture okay. Now the next investigation in front of all of you is a this is beta x-ray of the cervical spine. This is x-ray of the cervical spine lateral view. This is x-ray of the cervical spine lateral view. And if you count from top, from top to bottom, this is the elongated shadow of the odontoid process which is the elongated body of C2 vertebra. So count C2, this is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and this shows, image shows fracture of the spinous process of C7 vertebra which was as I told you in the class first described amongst group of people working in Australia as you know, clay shovel, they're picking up clay and throwing it. When they develop this kind of fracture of the spinous process of C7, it can happen in T1 also, but most common is C7. This is why this is called as clay shoveler's fracture. Clay shoveler's fracture. So fracture of the spinous process of C7 vertebra is called as clay shoveler's injury or clay shoveler's fracture. Okay, so next is... Uh, <clears throat> An image which I have put of the two, you know, tractions are not very commonly used uh, in, uh, in today's orthopedic practice, but it can be used sometimes. So these are two important tractions which I want all of you to remember. The first traction is for a child less than two years with fracture shaft of femur. A child less than two years with fracture shaft of femur can be managed initially and I'm saying initially till the time there is callus and other things uh, <clears throat> uh, does take place and this kind of traction is what is called as gallows or Brine's traction. This is called as gallows or Brine's traction. Gallows or Brine's traction. Very good. I think some of the students are really have, uh, I think, uh, read orthopedics quite nicely. I'm very happy because most of them are actually giving uh, uh, correct answers for this. So this is gallows or Brine's traction. This is one thing which you can remember. And the second image is not very commonly used again, but for some children who come with supracondylar fracture of the humerus, lot of swelling or wounds we can use sometimes for initial treatment Dunlop's or Smith's traction Dunlop's or Smith's traction so this is an image which you need to identify and the indication for this again is supra condylar fracture of humerus 
I think these are important. Uh, uh, this is fine, I think, for tractions, and we don't expect much else to come in the examination. Okay, this is an interesting image. This is a very interesting image. I am getting some. Uh, yeah, I am getting some good. I think questions. Uh, okay, yeah, this is a very interesting image. This is an MRI scan, and then we can. I have put the second image, which is a clinical test. So look at this first MRI scan of the knee joint. Uh, what image? This is beta. So we can have a sagittal, coronal. Or axial cuts on MRI scan. This is a classical coronal cut. Shows on this is the medial side and this is the lateral side of the knee joint. On the medial side, can all of you see this lig ligament running? This is on the medial side called as what ligament? Medial collateral ligament. Collateral ligaments are extra capsular, extra synovial structures. So they are coronal plane stabilizers. Sometimes you have a severe valgus force on the knee. This is what can happen. Can all of you see this ligament broken at this place? Yes or no? So this is a patient who has come to us with a MCL injury, medial collateral ligament. So quick points to remember about medial collateral ligament. So this is MCL injury, which is quite commonly seen, medial collateral ligament. So this is first of all injured due to a severe valgus force. Isn't it? Valgus matlab outward pointing force. And when we check the patients, whether MCL is intact or not intact, this is exactly what we do. So we take the patient, as you can see, the examiner's hand is here. This is the medial side. This is the lateral side. I think you cannot see. This is the lateral side. I think this is visible. Yes. So the examiner is holding the knee and they are actually now forcing the leg into valgus outside laterally and as you can see here this is the normal this is see how the leg is drifting into the valgus which will happen why because this ligament mcl is torn it is broken which is why you can take the leg into a valgus position because there is no restraining force clinical test of choice to check this is an examination question to check for medial collateral ligament injury valgus stress test valgus stress test is the clinical test of choice to see injury to which ligament medial collateral ligament and normally this is done in about 30 degrees of knee flexion okay now most common knee ligament injury most common knee ligament injury is exactly this so all of you can see here an intact anterior cruciate ligament and in the other knee, you can't see any fibers. So this is a, a patient who has come to you with what injury? Anterior cruciate ligament injury. You must have read in anatomy also, both anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments are intracapsular structures, but they are still outside the synovium. So intracapsular, extra synovial. Out of the four ligaments in the knee joint, ACL, PCL, LCL, and MCL, ACL is the most common ligament injury in the knee joint. Very, very commonly. So when you are playing football, when you are walking, there is a suddenly twisting injury to the knee. It can result in injury to the anterior cruciate ligament. And the role of ACL is that it does not allow this tibia to go ahead in the during the process of walking. So it prevents the anterior slide of tibia on the femur. Tibia ko aage jane se rokta hai. So it prevents the anterior slide or translation. So if you have an ACL injury, the tibia can actually slide or translate anteriorly with respect to the femur while you are walking. This is exactly what you see. So first point ACL ka, this is the most common knee ligament injury. The most commonly done test to establish this is what is called as Lackman's test. So this is the most common done test. It's called as Lackman's test. And in the Lackman's test, see the examiner is trying to just pull the tibia anterior to see whether ACL, agar if the ACL is intact, the examiner will not be able to pull it anteriorly. If the ACL is torn, the examiner will be able to hold the tibia and will be able to slide it anterior. So this is Lackman's test. Most commonly done test is also, uh, it's done in acute injuries basically.
and it is basically done with the knee in about 10 to 15 degrees of flexion. So these are the three points. The other tests which are done to establish ACL injuries apart from Lachman's one is anterior drawer test. Anterior drawer test and the third one which is called as pivot shift test. Anterior drawer test or and pivot shift test test pivot shift test so this is like the three important tests which are done to establish the diagnosis of injury to anterior cruciate ligament okay next mri is from the shoulder and all of you can see the head of the humerus and the glenoid this is anterior and this is posterior so these are axial or transverse cuts where is this arrow pointing where is this arrow pointing? So what is the diagnosis beta here? Anybody? Anybody who can uh, tell me what is the diagnosis here? You can see a small structure torn here. This is an injury to the anterior labrum of the glenoid. Anterior labrum. So what, what uh, injury does cause an injury to the anterior glenoid labrum very commonly? This is classically a patient who has recurrent shoulder dislocation, isn't it? A recurrent a recurrent shoulder dislocation. And the most common pathological lesion the most common pathological lesion in these patients who have recurrent anterior dislocations of the shoulder joint is what is exactly this this is called as bankart's lesion this is called as bankart's lesion which is nothing but injury to the anterior glenoid labrum Injury to the anterior glenoid labrum. This is called as Bankart's lesion. This is called as Bankart's lesion. I think, uh, okay. This is called as Bankart's lesion. This is called as Bankart's lesion, which is injury to the anterior glenoid labrum. This is the most common pathological lesion which is seen in patients with recurrent anterior shoulder dislocation. Now, I can't see, uh, but I hope, uh, all of, are all of you able to hear me? I can't see the, okay, just give me one second, I think. Uh, okay, I think, yes. So, Bankart's lesion is where uh, I think, yeah, this is fine. So, Bankart's lesion is, uh, are all of you able to hear me, yes or no? Yeah, I'm not getting any, I think, uh, I hope, yes. Great, great, okay, fine, 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 fine. Thank you, thank you so much, yeah. Good. So this is Bankart's lesion, which is, you know, another lesion which is called as Hillsack's lesion is when this head of the humerus goes in front and uh, the, the posterior part of the head of the humerus strikes the glenoid. So a bony defect in the posterior part of the head of the humerus, that's called as Hillsack's lesion. But Bankart's is the most common lesion and this is how Bankart's lesion is identified as far as the examination is concerned. Okay. Yes, I have got. Thank you so much. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Now, beta, ye to very commonly seen. So, this is an x-ray of what fracture? Fracture of your collarbone, which is fracture of clavicle. Fracture of clavicle, most common site is at the junction of medial two-thirds and lateral one-third. 
So medial two thirds, lateral one third, it's an S shaped bone, clavicle, that's the most common site of fracture. And uh, clavicle fractures are normally managed. In fact, this is the most common fracture which is seen in adults. This is the most common fracture in childbirths. In so deliveries and most common complication. Most common complication of clavicle fracture is a malunion. Is a malunion. Just remember this part, the most common complication for clavicle fracture is a malunion. This is very, very important. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, most common, let me see where we have reached. Okay, so most common complication is a malunion, malunion. Okay, these are the questions which are asked from clavicles. Now, I just wanted, uh, so beta, now somebody is asking, I think, sir, change ho gaya hai. Yes, it has changed. We know that uh, uh, it has changed in Gray's Anatomy as at the junction of three-fifths and two-fifths. We will still, we will still persist with medial two thirds and lateral one thirds because, 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 in orthopedic textbooks that change has still not come. It has not come. So, your examination questions, as we told in the class, also to all of you, all online and offline students, there won't be both the choices. You know, the question is basically been taken from anatomy textbook. There is an option of medial uh, three fifths and lateral two fifths, but but it is medial two-thirds and lateral one-thirds, which is in all clinical probability still accepted as the best answer for the most common site, most common site. So please, you go ahead with this only, okay? So don't uh, change that concept in your mind. We know this, but we still not changed it because it still hasn't changed our uh, orthopedic textbook still now. Okay, now this is something which I wanted, uh, 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 wanted all of you, you know, just discuss this, uh, you know, valgus and varus uh, uh, things because there are a lot of questions in the last few examinations which have come from valgus and varus uh, two joints where I want all of you to be absolutely sure ke kaise bolna hai. when to say valgus and when to say varus is in the elbow and in the knee hai na? so elbow mein beta aap logo ne anatomy mein, you must have read in anatomy something which is called as carrying angle of the elbow Carrying angle of the elbow is an angle between, as you can see here, and I've given you the diagram for this, long axis of the arm and long axis of the forearm, which passes in the ulna. Carrying angle of the elbow is normally accepted as between 5 and 15 degrees. Or normally, if you keep your hand straight, you know, with palm facing in front, the forearm is slightly outside or in valgus as compared to arm, which is around 8 to 10 degrees, you know, 7 to 10 degrees in males, and slightly more in females, slightly more in females, but the accepted range for this is 5 to 15 degrees. So, this is the normal angle, carrying angle of the elbow. Now, look at this picture. So, this is how long axis of the forearm, sorry, this is how the long axis of the arm and the forearm is. So, this angle which is formed. This is called as the carrying angle, which I have drawn here. This is normal. When this angle is less than 5 degrees, this is called as cubitus varus deformity. While when this angle is more than 15 degrees, this is called as cubitus valgus deformity. Cubitus valgus. So, please remember this and make a concept in your mind. It is good to, uh, uh, you know... Uh, kind of uh, remember, you know, the causes for this. But if you can remember what exactly is cubitus varus and valgus, that is fantastic. Cubitus varus, carrying angle of less than 5 degrees. Cubitus valgus, a carrying angle of more than 15 degrees. We have already discussed the most common cause of cubitus varus is a malunited supracondylar fracture previously, which is called as gun stock deformity. And one of the most important causes of cubitus valgus is a non-union of lateral condyle fractures, which I showed you. So, you can remember the causes, but just remember that the concept on which this is based is what is called as 
carrying angle around the elbow. Okay, similarly in the knee joint, there is no named angle in the knee joint here, which on which, but yes, there is something called as Q angle, but I am not going to detail about the Q angle, but just remember, same concept in the knee joint, this is your normal angle, which is again slightly, you know, uh, about 5 to 7 degrees of valgus in an adult in the knee. If this angle decreases, so if the leg moves towards the midline, this is called as genu varus, while if the leg moves away from the midline, if drifts away from the midline, it is called as genu valgus deformity. Uh, okay, so genu varus and genu valgus. Now, just a few important things, what can come in the examination? Most common cause of both genu varus and genu valgus in children. Most common cause of both genu varus and genu valgus in children is rickets. Remember this. While the difference is in adults, in case of genu varus, in adults, most common cause of genu virus in adults, osteoarthritis of the knee joint. And I have a picture, I'll show you that also. Osteoarthritis of the knee joint. While most common cause of genu valgus in adults is, so most common cause of genu valgus in adults is rheumatoid arthritis, is rheumatoid arthritis, is rheumatoid arthritis. Remember that genu valgus in children, when severe, both the knees strike together is also called as a knock knee deformity knock knee so this is exactly genu virus and for any joint in the body just concentrate the joint is made of two bones and which is how i have taught all of you in the class a proximal bone and the distal bone if because of any underlying pathology the distal bone drifts away from the midline produces a valgus deformity if the distal bone drifts towards the midline it produces a classical varus deformity and there are various causes for a varus and a valgus getting produced at a particular joint we now know and i hope all of you will remember the important causes of cubitus varus cubitus valgus genu virus and genu valgus genu valgus okay now a picture which shows two important uh, a picture which shows two important cast here and uh, <clears throat> one is on the left one is on the right now, this was a question which came in the examination, I think, last year about this uh, small, you know, cast which are produced, put in the upper limb. One on the left. So, this one is a cast which extends till with joint, metacarpophalangeal joint. And this is just distal to the elbow, not involving the thumb, not involving the thumb is a Coley's cast. Coley's cast. So, important points about Coley's cast. And please remember these points in the examination because we know that the questions have been asked. In the Coley's cast, first it is a below elbow plaster of Paris cast. That's number one. The position of the wrist when we have to reduce is that of palmar flexion and ulnar deviation. Palmer flexion and ulnar deviation. This is to reduce the initial displacements which are dorsiflexed. And so posterior and lateral displacement ko correct karne ke liye, we put the cast in such a way that the wrist is in palmer flexion and medial or ulnar deviation. So second point, wrist in palmer flexion plus medial deviation and this kind of cast in which the wrist joint is in palmar flexion and medial deviation what is this cast called as this is called as hand shaking cast this is called as hand shaking cast remember this name now so these are the important points about how the fracture is reduced and how it is managed in a plaster. I want all of you to please concentrate that in a Coley's cast, and this is a very important point in a Coley's cast, the thumb is completely spared. 
means that the plaster does not incorporate or involve the thumb. You can see this as it is only till the metacarpophalangeal joint. The other two distal and proximal phalanges are not involved in a coalesce cast. So please remember this. While the second plaster here, the, this one, is for a scaphoid fracture. Is for what fracture? A scaphoid fracture in which, as you can see, the thumb is incorporated. Yes or no? So a few points about scaphoid fracture are, so few important points about scaphoid cast are, first point that the scaphoid cast is again a below elbow cast, but the wrist is in slight dorsiflexion plus radial deviation. So slight dorsiflexion and slight radial deviation, which is classically what is called as a glass holding position. This is called as a glass holding position of the cast. Glass holding position. So hand shaking cast is Coley's cast and glass holding position or glass holding cast is a scaphoid cast. So these are two important named plasters which are used in upper extremity trauma. And other thing which I want all of you to remember is, look at this, the thumb is involved till the IP, interphalangeal joint. So it involves or incorporates the thumb till the interphalangeal joint. So please remember this very, very, very important. Scaphoid is one of the bones, as I have taught all of you, is responsible or can cause, if not treated properly, avascular necrosis, avascular necrosis. So please remember these important points and differences, how you identify these plasters in the examination. Okay, now two important splints, uh, splints, you know, are supports which are used. So on the left is one of the splints which is used for, so you can see this splint which is keeping the, in the finger distal, so this is the DIP joint of the finger. This is the DIP joint of the finger. It is keeping it hyperextended. So this is what is called as a mallet finger splint. This is called as a mallet finger splint. And what is mallet finger? Mallet finger is a condition in which there is a injury to the extensor tendon for the DIP joint. So the extensor tendon which comes and gets attached or inserted in the distal phalanx gets injured due to which there is a slight flexion at the DIP joint which takes place after the injury. So the treatment for this involves putting the DIP joint in hyperextension by using this splint which is called as mallet finger splint, mallet finger splint, okay. And the second one is all of you know this now is what is called as a cock up splint. This is called as a cock up splint which is obviously used for injuries to the radial nerve and we will see this radial nerve injuries very very commonly are seen along with fractures of the shaft of the humerus. So this is exactly cock up splint allows the wrist to be positioned in a position of dorsiflexion till the time the radial uh, nerve is recovering. Okay. Now, okay, what is this splint beta? The next one, this is a splint uh, which is keeping the ankle joint in a neutral position, does not, does not, does not allow it to fall down. So this is what is called as AFO and AFO stands for ankle foot orthosis. Ankle foot orthosis. And A4 ankle foot orthosis is given for a foot drop deformity, foot drop deformity. And which nerve injury commonly produces a foot drop deformity? That is an injury to which nerve? Common peroneal nerve. Common peroneal nerve injuries are ones which are responsible for producing a foot drop deformity very commonly. And you can't allow the patient to walk with a uh, patient's, uh, you know, a foot in plantar flex position. So we give this splint, what is called as AFO or ankle foot orthosis. Orthosis. Okay. Now next X-ray is basically a couple of X-rays. One is absolutely normal on the left. This is how the head of the femur inside the socket or the hip joint should look like. On the right side, you can see the head of the femur has changed its shape. No, instead of being 
oval it is now flattened a lot of changes in the density in the head of the femur so what is this diagnosis spot diagnosis this is a patient who has developed a vascular necrosis a vascular necrosis of the femoral head we will only concentrate upon the avascular necrosis of the femoral head. All of you should know that the most common cause of developing avian of the femoral head is idiopathic avian. And as far as the traumatic avian of the head of the femur is concerned, there are two important injuries which can lead to avascular necrosis of the femoral head after a trauma. One is posterior hip dislocation and the second is the fracture neck of femur <clears throat> posterior hip dislocation and fracture of the neck of the femur so these are two injuries which are known to cause avascular necrosis of the head of the femur the patient develops pain and restriction of movements just also remember that the investigation of choice investigation of choice to understand how much vascularity is there whether the head is viable or not MRI scan MRI scan is the investigation of choice to study the pattern of avascular necrosis as far as the femoral head is concerned yes somebody is writing steroids that's correct uh, steroid is uh, uh, the most common drug induced avian yes and somebody is writing parthes disease here but a parthes is not this i'll show you i have an extra parthes disease parthes is something which happens in young children between four and eight years just remember just go along with what we are studying in the class so that it becomes easier for you when you have the examinations avian would predominantly happen in where it will happen in uh, uh, basically in case of uh, uh, skeletally mature patient okay Yes, what does this show now? On the left, on the right, this is very important. On the left, you have a patient who is walking. This is patient's right leg. This is patient's left leg. Anything which all of you can uh, see here. On the left, any problem in this part as compared to the right side where you can see a very prominent tendon getting attached here. What is this tendon? This is Achilles tendon. Okay. So, if you don't see any prominence of the Achilles tendon on the left side, this means that this is a patient of Achilles tendon injury or rupture. Achilles tendon injury or rupture or tendo Achilles injury, which is again a quite a commonly seen injuries in sports people and those who have had some kind of you know steroid injections or long-standing comorbid conditions. And Achilles tendon injury, the diagnosis clinical diagnosis is made by asking the patient to lie prone as you can see here and we hold the patient's calf muscles and squeeze it so when you squeeze it this is gastrocnemius and soleus when you squeeze normally the foot should because of contraction getting transmitted through the tendon should get more into plantar flexion in case this plantar flexion is not happening so when you squeeze but the plantar flexion is not happening. Why? Because this tendon is injured here. This is what is called as Thompson's test. This is called as Thompson's test to diagnose uh, uh, tendo Achilles or Achilles tendon injury. This is called as Thompson's test to diagnose Achilles tendon injury. So on squeezing or contraction, if the plantar flexion is not happening, this is called as Thompson's test thompson's test i think this is a question which came in the last examination if i uh, don't uh, you know if i'm not wrong this is a patient who has got a problem with what what is this injury so there's some sports people who you know get an injury of the biceps tendon isn't this is a biceps tendon injury And biceps tendon injury can happen both at the proximal part or the distal part, depending upon where the tendon is torn. You can see the bulging of the biceps. This is the 
tendon which has probably torn in the proximal part so the muscle mass has retracted distally and you can see the prominence and this is the biceps tendon injury prominence or so the biceps muscle which you can see this sign is what is called as Popeye sign. Biceps tendon rupture or injury is what is called as Popeye sign and this is uh, uh, something which is you know cartoon character which was very very famous since I think every one of us has watched so Popeye sign is what is uh, seen in case of injuries to the bypass actually a prox proximal biceps tendon injury re leads to a classical Popeye sign okay okay so this uh, I think takes care of the important uh, uh, x-rays and images as far as the trauma part is concerned the next group of uh, Images come from the second topic which is important which is called as metabolic bone disease, metabolic bone disease and the first x-ray here shows what? Shows a fracture in the subtrochantric region of the femur. A fracture in the subtrochantric region of the femur when it is caused because of almost minimal trauma or minimal velocity of trauma classically happens in those patients who are on long term anti osteoporotic therapy with bisphosphonates. This is what is called as atypical fractures. Atypical fractures and they normally take place when you exceed more than three years of bisphosphonate use. So remember, even a 65-year-old patient who has been on long-term therapy with either alendronate, ibandronate, drizidronate, zolidronate, right, and comes suddenly to one day in a hospital with a pain in the thigh with inability to walk, has come to you with what? Has come to you with a classical atypical fracture. Kindly remember this important term, atypical fracture. This is a fracture which happens because you, when you give bisphosphonate for a long term, bisphosphonates are known to inhibit the osteoclastic activity. So, they decrease resorption, but we have also known from the our orthopedic uh, classes that unless both osteoclast and osteoblast work simultaneously, the bone remodeling cycle cannot continue normally. And when the bone remodeling cycle is impaired for a long term, it ultimately leads to bones becoming weak. This is the result. So patients with long term bisphosphonates can develop these fractures called as atypical fractures. Atypical fractures. Okay. The second image from metabolic bone disease. What does this show to us? Yes, it shows deformities in the legs. It shows fractures at multiple areas as you can see here, as you can see here in the legs normally. Also, this is a young child because you can see the open growth plate. So, what is the spot diagnosis beta here? Fractures in the lower limb on x-ray in different stages of healing with the legs deformed in a skeletally young patient. Answer for this is only one. This is osteogenesis imperfecta. This is osteogenesis imperfecta, a condition which is classically autosomal dominant. And in children, there is a defect in type 1 collagen, type 1 collagen, type 1 collagen. So you see on an x-ray what you are seeing here and this is what all of you should remember from your examination point of view. If in a young child you basically see multiple fractures prominently localized to lower extremity, lower extremity. So multiple fractures will be seen all in different stages of healing. This is classically what is called as osteogenesis imperfecta. Also, the other name for this is brittle bone disease. And all of you know this is associated with some children having blue sclera and defect in the teeth. 
formation also so these are two more things which are associated presence of blue sclera and imperfect dentition which is called as dentinogenesis imperfecta then this is classically which is uh, what is seen in osteogenesis imperfecta a problem with type 1 collagen since birth okay yes so what is this now <laughs> a clinical picture and uh, an x-ray x-ray which is classic and i i want all of you to focus all of you to focus please on this x-ray x-ray of the wrist anterior posterior view okay extra obviously in a very skeletally immature child you can barely see two carpal bones here what is it showing is it showing no epiphysis correct it shows a very very wide abnormally wide growth plate of the physis but more importantly what i want all of you to see cupping and splaying of metaphysis cupping and splaying hallmark feature of which metabolic bone disease is this is rickets rickets classically on an x-ray is described as cupping and splaying of metaphysis why why does this happen and it happens because of the continuous formation or multiplication at the physis or the growth plate of the cells which put pressure on the soft metaphysis what's happening in rickets rickets is a defect of mineralization of the bone so bone is getting formed osteoid but it is not getting mineralized so it is soft and because it is soft the metaphysis sinks like a cup that's why it's called as cupping the metaphysis goes outwards it's called as splaying so cupping and splaying of metaphysis classical x-ray features in a child with rickets and the second one we have already discussed a bilateral genu valgus deformity in children is what is called as knock knee deformity also classically seen in which condition rickets rickets is as i told you most common cause of genu valgus in children most common cause also of genu varus in children is rickets so please remember this please remember this is important x-ray examination findings okay yes sir so what is this now <laughs> what is this now the left one is a line diagram right one is an actual x-ray so cons you have both now i have just magnified the right one because this is how we see on an x-ray so in some children when you take an x-ray this is how it looks like so first thing look at this the first thing look at the epiphysis or the secondary center of ossification showing a tremendous amount of calcification so this calcified epiphysis or epiphysis is called as wimberger's ring epiphysis and why this extraordinary calcification is taking place because of continuous bleeding i'll give you the hint i think you should you should know this uh, diagnosis but this is because of continuous bleeding this calcification takes place so wimberger's ring sign okay then in the region of metaphysis you can see this dense provisional zone of calcification this is called as white line of frankel sorry this is called as white line of frankel this is dense zone of provisional calcification so these are some terms which are used dense zone of provisional calcification just below this this area just underneath this uh, provisional calcification of white line of frankel you see radiolucent areas these are called as tremor fields zones so radiolucent areas just below the white line of frankel and finally the fourth and the last is these extra spurs which are formed in the metaphysis and some fractures these are called as pelkins spurs or pelkins fractures 
all these four fancy names which I have written Wimbergers, Ring Epiphysis, White Line of Frankel, Trummer Field Zones, and Pelkin Spurs or Fractures classically are seen in which condition? Scurvy. And scurvy is because of lack of vitamin C. So decreased levels of vitamin C in children can lead to impaired collagen synthesis because collagen is formed from hydroxylation of lysine and proline which does not take place in deficiencies of vitamin C. So improper collagen synthesis can lead to recurrent bleeding. So please don't remember scurvy just by bleeding gums. There is bleeding everywhere. There is a tremendous amount of subperiosteal, you know, below the periosteum bleeding which takes place in the children. That is why these children are like, you know, pseudo paralysis. It is so painful for these children in scurvy. Scurvy is a very painful condition. And these are the important x-ray findings which you see in patients with scurvy. Because of recurrent bleedings, these kind of changes do take place in the uh, bones in a scurvy patient. So, Wimberger's ring sign, then white line of Frankel, trauma field zones, and Pelkin's fractures or spurs you see in scurvy. Okay, <clears throat> I think the next metabolic bone disease. What do we see here, beta? We see here a pelvis x-ray with hips and the bones like femur. And what we can see just at the outset, if you observe, extremely white or radiodense bones. Yes or no? What is this condition? This condition in which the bones are extraordinarily white or radiodense. So increased radiodense bones in children. Increased radiodense bones in children are a result of def are as a result of defect in osteoclastic activity. Are a result of a defect in osteoclastic activity since birth. So, from the childhood, there is a defect in osteoclastic activity. So, this defect in osteoclastic activity, the osteoblasts are working. So, they keep on producing the bone which is very, very dense. It is hard also, but it's not strong. And this condition, this condition is what is called as osteopetrosis, also called as marble bone disease. This is called as marble bone disease, osteopetrosis, also called as marble bone disease. And there are a lot of uh, things which take place in osteopetrosis. Uh, this is just the basic thing, you know, the, apart from that, a uh, lot of signs, you know, osteopetrosis can be dominant in a recessive form. Recessive obviously is very, very, uh, you know, harsh and sometimes you lose a lot of cranial nerve palsies and then, you know, a lot of radiological features like endo bones, so bone in a bone appearance or other kinds of changes do take place but just remember that if you see on an x-ray extremely radio dense bones or very very white or radio density that is probably what has been asked to you is a question on osteopetrosis or marble bone disease okay the last of the metabolic bone diseases uh, the last of the metabolic bone diseases just observe this x-ray beta is on the right side a patient who has got severe amount of destruction, you know, similar amount of lysis. This is tibia x-ray. I can just zoom it more. And then on the other parts, tremendous amount of sclerosis or whiteness. Same bone having excessive osteoclastic activity. And in the other parts, ex excessive amount of sclerosis which takes place. What is this condition? So there is a condition which is called as, so such kind of x-rays are seen in a condition which is called as Paget's disease of bone. Paget's disease of bone and Paget's is the condition which is not very commonly seen in our country. This is more commonly seen in western population. So Paget's disease mein kya hai? It is a condition in which there is a defective osteoclastic. There is a defective osteoclastic functioning What's happening is that this defective osteoclastic, excessive osteoclastic resorption is followed by this bone formation which is hypervascular, soft 
hypervascular bone which is getting formed and this is what is called as classically paget's disease normally seen in males more than 45 to 50 years this paget's disease of bone and some people think that this is basically idiopathic some people think that this is linked to a paramyxovirus infection just remember that paget's disease is normally the drug of choice for the management of paget's disease is bisphosphonates only And in rare cases, I have told you and I have taught all of you that this can result, if not untreated and left like this, this can in, you know, long-standing cases result in development of a secondary osteogenic sarcoma. So this is like a pre-malignant condition. If it stays long for a long duration of time, it can result in a secondary osteogenic sarcoma. Secondary is not same as what you see in second decade. Secondary osteosarcoma is what you see in normally the fifth decades of life. So Paget's disease of bone. Some people say this is also called osteitis deformance, Paget's disease. But yes, it can be asked in the examination. More commonly seen in males, more than 45 to 50 years. And there is a Problem again in what? Defective osteoclastic function. So I've told you two diseases or two disorders in which there is a defect in the osteoclast in the young children. Defective osteoclastic resorption can cause marble bone disease or osteopetrosis. And in adults, a defect in osteoclastic activity can result in Paget's disease of bone. Paget's disease of bone. Okay, so we come to the end of uh, this uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I think uh, the second part, which is metabolic bone diseases, the part of this uh, image-based revision session for your upcoming FMG examination. And uh, <clears throat> we now will start with infections and systemic orthopedics for your examination. And uh, <clears throat> the first important uh, image or X-ray which I want to show all of you, and then there is a question there also, what is... Uh, 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 what is a spot diagnosis? So, what we see here is a bone, which is, if you, now, this is to a, this is a subtle finding, which all of you should uh, be able to actually, you know, develop a habit of understanding and identifying in the examination. So, look at this. Can all of you identify here a sclerotic segment of bone which is present inside? Yes or no? This is what is termed as sequestrum so a dead sclerotic bone which is present inside in a patient who has a long standing infection of the bone is called as a sequestrum and this sequestrum is the hallmark radiological feature of which condition chronic osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis which is a infection of the bone which persists for a long duration, typically more than three months. And sequestrum is described as a dead bone, which is surrounded by infected tissue, infected granulation or infected tissue inside. And as I uh, tell every student in the class, it is this sequestrum which is supposed to be the radiological hallmark of chronic osteomyelitis. If I am labeling any patient of chronic osteomyelitis, I should be able to identify sequestrum or presence of sequestrum inside the bone. So take a dead bone, which is uh, avascular and which is surrounded by all infected tissue, debris and microorganisms, is an epicenter from where the infection keeps, keeps on recurring again and again and again in a patient who has chronic osteomyelitis and this is responsible for these patients who have a, a presence of chronic so how do these patients present so as I, let's first do the radiological features so sequestrum is a radiological hallmark the second feature which i see here is the presence of this you know dense new bone around the sequestrum this is called as involucrum so it is a presence of dense bone in rather a dense new bone around the sequestrum. This is called as involucrum. And the third finding which we see in patients with chronic osteomyelitis are these presence of small openings in the bone and these are called as cloacae. 
and cloacae are small openings in the bone from where after an infectious episode the pus keeps on coming out so just recite the pus discharge from the bone comes out through the small openings which are called as cloacae called as cloacae so these are the three important terms which are used for patients of chronic osteomyelitis now so questions do come from image identification to questions will also come from a clinical based picture and they'll ask you a patient so and so comes and presents to a doctor with such an x-ray most important clinical feature of a patient who is presented or who comes with chronic osteomyelitis is the presence of a chronic discharging sinus a chronic discharging sinus and in this discharge there is presence of pus and small bony fragments There's a presence of pus and the presence of small pieces of bone which keeps on coming out through this pus and this is the clinical hallmark of how patients of chronic osteomyelitis come by and one last question which has come from chronic osteomyelitis in these fmg examinations previous year papers is the most common complication of how these patients so I've, i told all of you in the class that no matter what we do in terms of treatment of these patients with chronic osteomyelitis they they keep on coming back again and again and again with the same thing so after every three or four months the patients will come back to you with again the same okay doc sub since last one week i am having fever i am having so much of pain and swelling and redness and there is a significant amount of pus discharge which is coming out of this sinus so the most common complication of a patient who has a long-standing bone infection is an acute exacerbation of infection so these acute episodes or exacerbation or just you can say if exacerbation is tough acute flare-up of infection which may keep on happening after every three or four months and this is how the patients come back so unless and until we address and remove the entire uh, sequestrum <clears throat> from the infected bone we cannot treat chronic osteomyelitis which is why the surgical procedure of choice is a sequestrectomy and saucerization which we discussed in the class okay the second x-ray from uh, the topic of infections is a patient of you know the knee x-ray for a patient showing a lesion in the metaphysis of proximal tibia and just by looking at this forget about any theory here just by looking at this x-ray i would like to describe this uh, lesion rather which i can see in the proximal metaphysis of tibia is a radio lucent metaphyseal lesion which in this case is actually an abscess so radiolucent metaphyseal lesion surrounded by sclerosis dense white so all of you can see here white dense sclerosis surrounding this lesion all around this sclerosis means that the host or the patient's defense mechanism is able to actually fight and limit the spread of infection this is the most common type of subacute osteomyelitis which is seen in clinical practice and friends this is called as brody's abscess this is brody's abscess which is a form of subacute osteomyelitis which is seen in the metaphysis and this is how it presents with a small abscess which appears like a radiolucent lesion in the metaphysis and surrounded by a dense sclerosis which is the ability of the patient to actually fight this infection and limit the spread so this is classically how brody's abscess would present in an x-ray in an examination okay now the next uh, set of images are actually two one is an mri image and other are clinical images and this mri image shows problems here severe synovitis and involvement of bone with clinical picture you can see presence of a classical flexion of the knee classical posterior drop or subluxation of the tibia and external rotation so this is an mri and a clinical clinical picture from the patient who has 
ट्यूबरकोलोसिस ऑफ द नी जॉइंट टीबी ऑफ द नी टीबी ऑफ द नी इज आई वुड नॉट से वेरी कॉमन इट्स थर्ड मोस्ट कॉमन साइट आफ्टर स्पाइन इन द हिप बट वेन इट डज हैपन initially it is synovitis so it brings the knee into flexion because that's where the knee has more capacity and the patient feels less pain but if it persists it produces this classical deformity in late stages so in late stages of tb knee there is a deformity which is called as triple deformity there is a deformity which is called as triple deformity of the knee joint and this is how it looks like and triple means three components so the triple deformity means presence of flexion of the knee a posterior subluxation of tibia and the third is actually an external rotation but there is a valgus and external rotation you just remember external rotation so these are three components flexion posterior subluxation of tibia and external rotation are components of triple deformity and triple deformity is a condition which is yes seen in late stages of tb what are the other causes of triple deformity so this triple deformity is also seen in late stages of rheumatoid arthritis in late stages of poliomyelitis and in ilio tibial band contractures so these are the three other conditions for all these fmg students i think you can all what all of you can remember tb and ra rheumatoid arthritis and tuberculosis as the two important causes wherein <clears throat> uh you would see a triple deformity as far as the knee joint is concerned okay so this is uh, how the triple deformity looks like yes next set of clinical pictures are basically from tuberculosis of the hip joint and there are few questions which have been asked in the previous years from tb of the hip the first thing is as i told you in the class also that the tb of the hip initial focus of infection is the roof of the acetabulum roof of the acet sorry roof of the acetabulum is the initial focus of infection it is from where the tuberculous infection starts so synovitis then early late and advanced arthritis there are three stages and then there's a stage of deformity finally which takes place so what are the various changes when the tb of the hip advances so this is one question which is asked second is this kind of an advanced arthritis when there's a significant amount of destruction which takes place look at this look at how much of destruction of the acetabulum has taken place and the head of the femur appears uh, you know like a small part in the big uh, thing so two important points which have been mentioned in the appearance of an x-ray is one this kind of acetabulum is called as a wandering acetabulum wandering acetabulum and this appearance of a small destroyed femoral head in a large uh, acetabulum is what is called as what is called as a mortar and a a mortar and a pestle appearance just remember these words mortar and pestle appearance is what you see in case of advanced tubercular arthritis now few students while marking the questions from the some of the books were asking me ki sir what is the attitude now please remember that in all the infection cases and this is a concept which i and i've always emphasized on concepts in all my classes in uh, the various batches when an infection happens and the patient is very painful the position with the joint assumes is such that it wants to increase the capacity you know of the joint so that the pain perception is less so while in case of knee joint there will be some flexion because by in a state of flexion the relative capacity increases same in case of hip joint because the first stage of synovitis patient has lot of pain so the first stage in which the synovitis takes place the leg is in abduction external rotation so faber you know flexion abduction external rotation is the attitude i think some of the books which all of you are marking this questions from shows that what do you see in tb so initial stages will show flexion abduction external rotation correct 
but as the disease progresses and destruction of the bones will take place synovitis will go down then there's a true deformity which starts setting in and the true deformity in the hip joint is same as what you see in case of posterior hip dislocation flexion adduction and internal rotation flexion adduction so when the arthritis sets in it is an adduction and an internal rotation deformity which takes place in the hip joint as well so kindly remember these important points so when you are marking an attitude of the limb you got to understand whether it is a stage of synovitis which is the first stage or whether it is a stage of late arthritis or advanced arthritis from which the question has come and finally obviously yes we can't obviously end the infection chapter without uh, looking at uh, the tuberculosis of the hip joint so friends these are two one x-ray and mri as far as the tb of the spine is considered and you know that tuberculosis of the spine is the most common site of musculoskeletal tuberculosis. In fact, more than 50% of the cases of TB in the musculoskeletal system happen in the spine. In the spine, the most common site is basically thoracic or the dorsal spine. thoracic or the dorsal spine and roughly T5, T6, T7. So, that's the levels which are most commonly affected. Now, <clears throat> when tuberculosis affects, as you can see, it normally affects two vertebra and the disc. So, two vertebra and the disc and this is right from the fact that the embryological blood supply, it is a single vessel which comes and then supplies this area. So, you know this area. So, when the infection does come because we know that this is a secondary infection which comes basically through the blood. It does affect this part. So, just remember that the most common presentation in TB spine or POT spine is involvement of the two vertebra and the disc in between, which we remembered as what is called as paradiscal presentation. Yes or no? Paradiscal presentation. Paradiscal presentation. Paradiscal position. So, these are the important points which all of you can remember. And yes, we know that as far as India is concerned, we still follow what treatment regime? Middle path regime, as was described by Dr. S.M. Tulli, and that's what we follow. So, we start all patients of it on ATT and we give them splint, and then we see in about three to six weeks' time whether they're improving or not. If they're not, then they are directly, uh, uh, you know, under, they have to undergo a surgery as far as decompression is concerned. So, these are the important points as far as tuberculosis of spine is concerned okay the next uh, important group of uh, clinical photographs comes from the topic of peripheral nerve injuries as far as uh, your uh, examination is concerned so quickly we will see what the various peripheral nerves and the brachial plexus injuries does produce so two pictures here very in interesting the first one classical wrist drop classical wrist drop and all of you know wrist drop is because of injury to which nerve? Now, few important points. Please focus on this. I've actually told them in detail and explained in, uh, with the course of the nerve in the class when we were doing peripheral nerve injuries. But wrist drop, injury to radial nerve. Where? When it is passing in the spiral groove. Yes, injury to radial nerve in the region of spiral groove because it is at this site wherein the fracture will stretch the nerve and it will cause injury. So, injury to the nerve in the region of spiral groove is the most common cause for wrist drop. Such kind of injury to the radial nerve is classified as a high radial nerve palsy. is called as a high radial nerve palsy. So, injury to the nerve in the spiral groove is called as high radial nerve palsy. And you know it produces a wrist drop deformity. We know what is the splint which is used here is the cock up splint, isn't it? That's we have already seen today. Till the time the nerve is recovering, we basically keep the wrist in a position of dorsiflexion. And I think we are discussed in the class also that if the nerve somehow does not recover after about uh, 15 to 18 months, then we can do some tendon transfer surgeries. The most commonly done tendon transfer surgery is the Jones tendon 
transfer surgery jones tendon transfer as described by sir robert jones as far as uh, this tendon transfer is concerned so this first picture is easy what is the second picture all about although this is the first picture is very commonly asked question the second picture is still not very commonly asked question in fmg examination but it's a very common concept which is asked in other examinations now friends look at this the left hand of the patient i think uh, we can write with this this is left and this is right the left hand of the patient is absolutely normal he can extend the wrist he can extend the fingers on the right side patient is able to extend the wrist so matlab koi no wrist drop but extension of the fingers is absent yes or no extension of the fingers is absent what does this suggest so patient is able to extend the wrist but not extend the fingers and the thumb this is a patient who has what nerve injury posterior interosseous nerve palsy isn't it this is posterior interosseous nerve palsy which uh now beta this is not median plus ulna this is not that this is not a complete clawing this is a patient who is unable to extend the fingers and the thumb which is what is uh, suggestive of a posterior interosseous nerve palsy which in short is also called as pin palsy or in terms of our understanding and description this is what is called as a low radial nerve injury remember these points we've already discussed in the workbook that the presentation of a patient depends upon the the site at which the radial nerve is injured and the inability of the patient to extend the fingers is because of paralysis of which muscle group here which muscle extends the finger at metacarpophalangeal joint extensor digitorum communis please don't forget this muscle edc or extensor digitorum communis communis is the muscle and why is patient not able to extend the thumb is because of extensor pollicis longus these are the two important muscles which are ones which are responsible for extension of thumb is epl extension of fingers is edc both of them are supplied by posterior interosseous nerve and as somebody has written sensory supply is normal absolutely right beta because posterior interosseous nerve is a pure motor nerve is a pure motor nerve it has got no sensory aspect but yes you should be able to understand the difference between whether the patient has wrist drop or the patient has this uh, finger drop deformity so this what is this deformity called as inability of the patient to extend the fingers this is what is termed as a classical finger and thumb drop deformities finger and thumb drop deformities so this is a detail but a detail which should be well understood by all of you as far as the injuries to the radial nerve are concerned at various levels okay now okay this is fine i think this is about radial nerve the second set of images are suggestive of three clinical tests which we employ and i just wanted all of you to get brushed up with these clinical tests before your examination which is why i put all these images in front of you so the first test is asking the patient to make a clasp or a fist and you can see as the arrow suggest that the index finger on the affected side patient is not able to flex this is called as pointing index sign also called as oschner's clasp test or hand of benediction this is because of why this is patient is not able to flex because of the paralysis of which two muscles the f flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis of the index finger okay so this is the first test which is called as pointing index test the second test is an appearance as i told you in the class also it is not exactly a test it is an appearance of how the hand looks like uh, uh, you know so when you see a hand in which the and please focus on the thumb only in which the thumb appears to be more extended and adducted more extended and adducted rather than thumb lying in front this suggests that this is an abnormal appearance of the hand this is called as an ape thumb deformity 
and eighth thumb deformity is based on the fact that which muscle is paralyzed this is paralysis of opponent's pollicis paralysis of opponent's pollicis okay so eighth thumb deformity is based upon paralysis of opponent's pollicis abnormal appearance of the thumb because it is extended and adducted as the extensors and adductors of the thumb are working what is not working is opponent's pollicis which is why the thumb comes in the same plane as the other fingers and the third clinical test is very very easy i think all of you know this this is called as the pen test asking the patient to abduct a thumb and touch a pen kept at a distance what are we seeing here which muscle abductor pollicis brevis isn't it we are seeing the functionality of abductor pollicis brevis all these three tests form the basis of clinical assessment of a patient with a suspected injury to which nerve median nerve so these are the important tests which are done as far as a clinical ass assessment of a patient with injury to which nerve median nerve is concerned so i want all of you to remember these three tests okay the next group of three pictures again are three clinical tests which i have put just to see or assess which nerve now here the obviously the ulnar nerve so the first test i think we can label like this the first test is what is called as card test the card test is you ask the patient to hold the card tightly between the fingers and you gently try to pull it so which muscle are you checking the strength of it is palmar interosseous muscle palmar interosseous isn't it you are asking the patient to hold it into the role of palmar interosseous is adduction of the fingers so when you adduct and hold it tightly you see whether the palmar interosseous has enough strength or not so card test is for palmar interosseous the second test in which you ask the patient to move the middle finger on both sides sideways is what is called as igawa's test so ask the patient because the middle finger has two you know the middle finger has two dorsal interosseous one on the radial side one on the medial side so when the radial one contracts the finger moves towards the radial side when the ulnar one contracts the middle finger moves towards the ulnar side igawa's test is assessment of dorsal interosseous muscle group dorsal interosseous beta there are four palmar and four dorsal interosseous so these are the two tests which are done card test and igawa's test the third test which you are asking the patient to hold a book between the thumb and the other fingers this is what is called as book test also called as fromens sign book test also called as froman sign and in book test of froman sign by asking the patient to hold a book between the thumb and the fingers look at this now what are you trying to see here what you are you are trying to see here is the right and the left hand of the patient left hand is normal because what is the patient using up what are you checking first by asking the patient to hold the book you are checking the power of the thumb adductor so adductor pollicis what you are checking which is the only thinar muscle which is supplied by ulnar nerve so if you hold it by using your adductor pollicis good this is normal if adductor pollicis is paralyzed the patient will still want to hold the book but he will hold it by using his flexor as the adductor is paralyzed so what is he using here flexor pollicis longus which is the one which is supplied by anterior interosseous nerve yes or no so he cheats because his adductor pollicis is not working he uses fpl to hold the book which is seen by a prominent flexion at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb so this is a side on which this which nerve is not working ulnar nerve is not working so book test of froman sign is checking the capability or the functionality of adductor pollicis so friends all these three clinical tests are used for the assessment of which peripheral nerve ulnar nerve so ulnar nerve uh, injury can be assessed by these three important tests card test igawa's test and book test of froman's sign okay yes next picture shows what shows a young child who has a left 
अपर एक्सट्रीमिटी विच इज एडक्टेड इंटरनली रोटेटेड एक्सटेंडेड एल्बो प्रोनेटेड फोर आर्म वॉट इज दिस सजेस्टिव ऑफ probably an injury with the child has sustained during the child birth this is classically what is how an herbs palsy presents most common type of injury to the brachial plexus is an injury to the upper trunk so it's an injury to upper trunk of the plexus or a supra clavicular brachial plexus injury these are the two important terms the root levels involved are c5 and c6 i will not go into the deformity because all of you know this that this is called as a policeman waiters or a porter stip deformity just remember that the nerves which actually get uh, involved in herbs palsy are these three so i want all of you to remember the names of these three nerves one is the axillary nerve which is why abduction is not there and the shoulder is adducted it is the musculocutaneous nerve which is why the elbow is not flexed and extended because it is the musculocutaneous nerve which supplies the biceps and the brachialis responsible for flexion and the shoulder is internally rotated because what is paralyzed the external rotator is the supra and the infraspinatus supplied by which nerve supra scapular nerve theek hai so these are the three nerves which are basically involved in uh, brachial plexus upper trunk herbs palsy which involves axillary nerve musculocutaneous nerve and supra scapular nerve so these three nerves get involved as a result of with this classic deformity what is called as <coughs> a policeman waiters or a porter's tip deformity is produced okay the final picture from the peripheral nerve injuries uh, is a couple of pictures once again the hand of the patient showing clawing so claw hand sorry claw hand which is also called as as we have discussed in the class claw hand is equivalent to paralysis of intrinsic muscles which are lumbricals and introsia of the hand so claw hand is also called as an in intrinsic minus hand deformity minus matlab intrinsic not working intrinsic minus hand deformity you have all read about uh, the claw hand in ulnar nerve injury but claw hand does happen also in a lower trunk brachial plexus lesion so claw hand along with this kind of picture so what is this showing involvement of uh, a sympathetic uh, disturbance when the t1 root is involved this is what is called as horner's syndrome isn't it horner syndrome with the components of ptosis meiosis and hydrosis and of thalamus and loss of cilio spinal reflex all of you are well aware about this i just wanted to show you clinical pictures so when a patient does present to you with an intrinsic minus hand deformity along with plus minus horner syndrome this kind of injury to the brachial plexus is what is called as clump case palsy or lower trunk brachial plexus or infra clavicular type of brachial plexus palsy involving the c8 and the t1 root c8 and t1 yes some chai, somebody has written partial claw hand is ulnar nerve complete claw hand is ulnar and median nerve yes you are absolutely right sir it is like this only but do remember as i have been telling in the classes also that it is ulnar nerve which needs to get involved for us to have a claw hand deformity median nerve does not produce claw hand okay so partial claw hand is ulnar nerve complete clawing is both median and ulnar nerve remember alone median nerve injury does not produce a claw hand deformity because it is the intrinsic minus hand and intrinsics basically are controlled by which nerve ulnar nerve ulnar nerve okay next set of our images comes from the chapter of orthopedic tumors or oncology so quickly we'll see what comes i think this is the question which came in the last examination which is a uh, lesion in the cortex cortex matlab outer shell of the bone most commonly in the tibia with a small lesion what is this lesion called as what is this radiolucent lesion in the cortex called as and any guess about what is the tumor here 
so this is a picture or a you know this is x-ray and ct scan both sagittal cut and axial cut of a patient who has osteoid osteoma osteoid osteoma which is the most common true benign tumor which is the most common true benign tumor happens in young adolescents so between an 11 to 20 years of age most common site the tibial and the femoral diaphysis femoral and the tibial diaphysis uh, this osteoid osteoma so this is a child who comes to you how osteoid osteoma is the most common true benign bone tumor and the child of osteoid osteoma comes to us with complaints of severe pain at night so night pains which get relieved by uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs when we give them this pathological lesion so now you should all know the radiology this pathological lesion which is seen in osteoid osteoma you can see a radiolucent lesion in the cortex this is what is called as nidus this is called as nidus which is the pathological lesion of osteoid osteoma a radiolucent lesion which is full of what prostaglandin so nidus is the lesion which all of us have to see to judge and diagnose it as osteoid osteoma in a young adolescent patient young adolescent patient okay yes what is the second picture pointing out to the second picture is pointing to obviously femur tibia this is definitely a lesion in the femur isn't it a huge lesion in the metaphysis now we have seen that in malignant tumors involving the bone and which are growing very fast causing rapid rapid destruction what happens is that because of rapid destruction and since the periosteum does not have enough time to form bone quickly since the tumor is destructing this periosteum lifts off from the bone so just concentrate on the arrow here as all of you can see here this periosteal shadow is getting lifted of the bone this is the this is the cortex of the bone which obviously is you know getting affected so this triangular appearance of the periosteum getting lifted and why is this getting lifted why because this tumor rapidly grows does not allow the periosteum to form bone so periosteum gets lifted because of this lesion this radiological appearance which is seen in aggressive bony lesions i will not say only tumors yes most commonly malignant lesions but any aggressive bony lesion will lead to this picture which is called as codman's triangle this is called codman's triangle and codman's triangle just remember is a radiological hallmark of aggressive bony lesions aggressive bony lesions and it is described as a triangular area a triangular area of subperiosteal newborn formation remember it is not a hallmark only of uh, osteogenic sarcoma <clears throat> codman's triangle is seen in aggressive malignant bony lesions aggressive malignant bony lesions codman's triangle okay yes what is this periosteal reaction so this periosteal reaction if you can see the tumor growth is in the soft tissues happening like rays of a sun isn't it like rays of a sun is an appearance which is what is called as sun ray or a sun burst appearance sun ray or a sunburst appearance which is yes what we see in osteogenic sarcoma and sun ray or a sunburst appearance this is a lower fibular you know distal fibular metaphyseal osteosarcoma which is seen here is uh, what you see so kya hota hai sun ray means what is sun ray appearance is when the malignant lesion grows jab wo grow karta into the soft tissues so just remember that the tumor growth 
in the soft tissues is along the blood vessels. So it's along the lines of the blood vessels which are there in the tumor and this kind of appearance is what is called as sun ray or a sun burst appearance is very very commonly seen in osteogenic sarcoma. Okay, yes. What is the next lesion? A tumor <clears throat> which is seen in the hand and this is an x-ray which shows a proximal phalangeal uh, tumor. This is something which is very commonly asked. I have taught you uh, most of the tumors which are asked in FMG examination, if not all basically. The most common tumor in the hand, bone tumor in the hand. So most common bone tumor in the hand is a benign cartilaginous tumor. A benign cartilaginous tumor in which, as you can see, in small bones of the hand like metacarpals and phalanges, you see cartilaginous tissue giving filled instead of bone marrow. So this is benign hyaline cartilage, which is bone ke hai, instead of marrow. This is what is called as enchondroma. This is called as enchondroma. Most common bone tumor in the hand, which is called as enchondroma. Enchondroma. And this is what you see here in the proximal phalanx of the middle finger <clears throat> okay yes next image next image next image here is three pictures here yes so what do you see here you see an abnormal tissue filling the medullary cavity of the femur in advanced cases if you see it on the both sides the tumor causing weakness and the upper parts bending down resembling the a gadget which a shepherd uses while the herd is grazing yes so a developmental abnormality which is seen in adolescents instead of normal bony tissue you see fibrous tissue filling up the medullary cavity this condition is called as fibrous dysplasia fibrous dysplasia now there is uh, <clears throat> fibrous dysplasia is a condition in which there is fibrous tissue which fills up the bone instead of normal medullary bony tissue so bones are weak fibrous dysplasia may I also taught you if you remember one very important endocrinal or hormonal disturbance which is called as McCune Albright syndrome in which a young girl has polyostotic so multiple bone with fibrous dysplasia precocious or early of happening or early occurring puberty and multiple skin pigmentation we call as cafe or lay spots so that's called as mccune so one thing which all of you should read and remember is that you see mccune albright's syndrome mccune albright's syndrome here in patients who have a polyostotic but the multiple bones with fibrous dysplasia so that's one thing which i think has already been covered in other classes also this all of you know this now what is this x-ray showing just returning back on the image as i told you in severe cases when the proximal femur bows down as you can see here it produces a deformity in advanced cases this is called as shepherd's crook deformity shepherd's crook deformity which is seen in case of patients with long standing fibrous dysplasia as a result of which the femoral head neck junction bends into a varus positioning because of weakness of the medial part so it resembles are thick this the fibrous dysplasia again the drug of choice after doing curettage and bone grafting is you use bisphosphonates here also to promote bone remodeling and bones to become strong okay yes sir what is the next image next image is an image of the knee joint showing a lesion very classical no coming from the metaphysis either it has a stalk so this is pedunculated or it is attached sessile a tumor which goes from the metaphysis 
most common benign bone tumor not true but most common benign bone tumor which is seen most common benign bone tumor which is seen in clinical practice is what is called as osteochondroma osteochondroma isn't it osteochondroma it's again a benign cartilaginous tissue second point most common site of osteochondroma distal femur the pattern of growth in which the tumor grows away from the center so if this is the center the tumor will always grow in a direction which is away from the center of the knee joint centrifugal growth pattern is seen centrifugal growth which means away from the center so it arises from the metaphysis arises from the metaphysis centrifugal pattern of growth and finally one more complication which has come from osteochondroma which is the most common complication the most common complication when these tumors start pressing the bursa bursal sac around the knee joint resulting in this inflammation and what is called as bursitis bursitis so lower end of the femur bursitis in long standing osteochondromas is their most common complication most common complication most common complication okay so these are important points about osteochondroma a question which has been very very commonly asked in fmg examinations is your ability to be able to see and identify osteochondroma as a benign tumor which uh, arises from the metaphysis okay two x rays in front of you i think this one is more important and i think if there is an image which comes uh, it should come like this only a large radiolucent lesion in the metaphysis of the proximal humerus this is an example of simple or uni cameral bone cyst simple or simple or uni cameral uni cameral means single cavity uni cameral means single cavity bone cyst which is what is seen so most common site of simple bone cyst is proximal humerus proximal humerus metaphysis yes and simple bone cyst is not exactly a tumor it is a fluid filled cavity cystic lesion a weak part of the bone centrally located lesion and one important x ray sign from which the questions have not been asked in fmg examination but definitely in neat examination is this thing what you see so in long standing simple bone cyst when you have a small piece of bone or cortex which breaks and comes to the bottom of the cavity as you can see here is lying in the bottom of the cavity this sign of simple bone cyst is what is called as on x ray a uh, fallen leaf or a fallen fragment sign some books also mention this as a trap door sign you can remember but these are the common words which are used a fallen leaf or a fallen fragment sign which is seen in simple bone cyst as an important x ray identification of simple bone cyst okay in contrast to this a lesion which is eccentric most commonly seen in proximal tibia is what is called as aneurysmal bone cyst so the features which differentiate aneurysmal bone cyst from simple bone cyst one it is seen in about 20 to 30 years age bracket simple bone cyst is in second decade second the cyst is filled with blood simple bone cyst is just a simple fluid cavity and most common site a here is proximal tibia there it is proximal humerus 
and finally fourth as you can see like giant cell tumor this is eccentric lesion eccentric lesion but friends just concentrate and see that both simple bone cyst and, and you have the pictures in front of you both are lesions or cysts which are seen in which part of the bone metaphysis up don't get confused by seeing an eccentric lesion and mark gct gct or giant cell tumor as we will see is a lesion in the epiphysis abhi both of them as you can see here this is what i have zoomed look at this eccentric lesion epiphysis is normal yes or no so the problem is in the metaphysis theek hai ji so this is aneurysmal bone cyst now look at the acha i'll show you in the gct just remember that if you see an eccentric lesion see whether this is epiphyseal or metaphyseal agar epiphyseal hai mark gct if it is metaphyseal mark abc as the answer mark abc as the answer so this is something which all of you should uh, remember and concentrate in the examination okay next set of images are a small lesion which is seen very very commonly in children at the junction of first second decade so 5 to 15 years most common malignancy which is seen is a blue round cell malignancy which is called as evings sarcoma evings sarcoma it's a malignant blue round cell tumor which is seen at the junction of first second decade of life between 5 and 15 years and evings sarcoma as i told you in the class is a tumor which is you know somehow it presents in young children exactly as a bone infection so it mimics osteomyelitis matlab the child of evings will have pain will have swelling will have redness will have warmth will have everything which is suggestive of osteomyelitis just that one osteomyelitis as we have already seen is infection this is a cancer malignancy so it is blood test more than that biopsy and other things which basically tells us how the evings sarcoma is different from a uh, osteomyelitis patient okay so this is how evings would look like evings is as you can see most commonly seen in the diaphysis of the femur and tibia that's number 1 and x ray more importantly x ray in a patients with the uh, evings sarcoma Yes, I think lot of students have got this right as saying onion peel appearance. Absolutely norm, absolutely correct. This is how classically the newborn formation in Ewing's does take place in the form of small layers. Like you peel an onion, you get layer after layer. So this periosteal reaction in Ewing's sarcoma is newborn formation in layers. This is called as onion peel appearance. onion peel appearance newborn formation in layers is what you see in evings sarcoma this is why it's called as an onion peel appearance and yes some people have written that beta evings is the most radio sensitive tumor which is absolutely right it is the most radio sensitive tumor but still it's also very chemo sensitive treatment of choice is not radiotherapy it is chemotherapy because we don't want the young children to get exposed to what exposed to radiations so that's why uh we give this and some you know Gen cytogenetics have established a lot of translocations here. Remember that the most common translocation is that of eleven twenty two chromosomal translocation. That is the cytogenetic association which is seen in these young kids who developed Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma. Okay. Yes. What is this next set of pictures suggesting? So first, see the first X-ray. when we zoom it definitely a malignant lesion in the distal femur so pehli cheez distal femur yes or no which part metaphysis metaphysis distal femoral metaphysis proliferative lesion in the second decade with you know uh, growth inside the soft tissues would suggest what lesion osteogenic sarcoma or just osteosarcoma 
osteogenic sarcoma or just osteosarcoma and this is what kind this is primary osteosarcoma not secondary jo maine aapko bataya tha which pages disease that was secondary this is primary osteosarcoma some important points about primary osteosarcoma it is normally seen in the second decade of life it is a metaphyseal lesion as i have told you yes or no and the most common site is around the knee and around the knee also distal femoral metaphysis so second most common site is proximal tibia so that is what osteosarcoma or how osteosarcoma look like as far as osteosarcoma uh, treatment is concerned you remember it's a radio uh, resistant tumor so the treatment for osteosarcoma is chemotherapy and surgery Yes or no? So that's how osteosarcoma will present you. And we have already discussed the various kind of periosteal reactions like sun ray or sunburst appearance and Cordman strangle, which may be present in this. I think the final two tumors which are there, which I want all of you to see, is one is this one, which I have given three pictures here. One of the skull. Other is the spine, and then rest the skeleton. You see. infiltration of the skull infiltration of the spine and the rest of the skeletal system most common primary bone malignancy multiple myeloma so this is the most common primary bone malignancy okay and the tumor which arises from which cells plasma cells yes or no a tumor which arises from the plasma cells and if you see what we have written in the workbook in the classes it is multiple myeloma which basically affects what <clears throat> the flat bones and the spine more commonly isn't it so this elderly male patients it's male more common than females they will complain with chronic back pain and vertebral fractures which if not diagnosed properly mist can lend lead to a lot of complications like metastasis and renal complications some of the important changes which you see in multiple myeloma on an x ray of the skull this skull appearance on multiple myeloma yes somebody has written raindrop it is the classical description of an skull x ray on multiple myeloma is presence of this multiple punched out lytic lesions in the skull yes some books also mention this as raindrop appearance but yes multiple punched out lytic lesions along with presence of pathological vertebral fractures pathological vertebral fractures is what you see in multiple myeloma now <clears throat> investigation i think i will not go discuss but yes serum electrophoresis is the best blood investigation investigation of choice always is a biopsy or a bone marrow aspirate treatment for multiple myeloma if done in time chemotherapy is the treatment and which drug melphalan is the drug of choice okay the last of the tumors which we can see here as far as x ray is concerned i think this is an x ray which has already come and come once in the examination and this is a skeletally mature patient a lesion which arises from the epiphysis from the epiphysis eccentric away from the center skeletally mature eccentric lesion away from the center epiphysial only one diagnosis giant cell tumor giant cell tumor also called as osteoclastoma osteoclastoma so few points about gct gct is something which is very 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 commonly asked in our examination fmg examination so we should know about giant cell tumor properly maine bola har samay class mein bhi aapko three points epiphyseal skeletally mature eccentric only three points will tell you gct is my diagnosis epiphyseal skeletally mature eccentric lesion gct is the answer and giant cell tumor benign but very very aggressive this lesion 
it is as i told you a tumor which arises from the epiphysis typically in 20 to 40 years patients it is an eccentric lesion so please remember these three points and if you know these three points I don't think you should be able to make any mistake in any of the examinations identifying giant cell tumor. Okay? So that's one. X-ray appearance, what is called as soap bubble appearance. And GCT is treated by excision and bone grafting. So GCT normally comes as images. This is the most common site of GCT, distal femur lower end of the femur epiphysis as you have an x-ray in front of you and I'm telling you because this x-ray has already come in the examination previously same x-ray lower end of the femur epiphyseal eccentric lesion GCT so please don't make a mistake GCT can come in this examination because it was not there in the last couple of examinations okay friends with this we come to the end of this <laughs> the next chapter for systemic orthopedics would be discussion quickly on various kinds of arthritis the first set of images are x-rays of the pelvis and x-ray of the spine. Look at which joint is getting affected. Which joint is this? This is sacroiliac joint sclerosis. Most common condition which causes sacroiliac joint sclerosis, ankylosing, spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis. What is the name? Ankylosing means bony fusion. Spondylitis is <clears throat> inflammation of the spine. So a disease which causes inflammation of the spine in the pelvis, axial skeleton, resulting in ankylosis or pathological fusion of the spine is what is called as ankylosing spondylitis. A condition which is zero negative, matlab RA factor negative, but HLA B27 positive. Okay, zero negative, matlab RA factor negative, but HLA B27 positive, and is a condition which I told you. Some important points: most common joint involved here is which joint? <coughs> Sacroiliac joint. So you can, you can have an x-ray of uh, the pelvis with this. Now two more radiological signs we'll discuss here. Completely fused appearance of the spine because of the formation of syndesmophytes and calcification of ligaments. This is what is called as a bamboo spine appearance. Bamboo spine appearance. Okay, and lastly, if you see the calcification of supra and interspinous ligaments producing a central radio dense line in the center, if you take an anterior posterior x ray, this sign is what is called as dagger sign. This is called as dagger sign. So, central. <clears throat> dagger sign now uh, some of the students I'll give you my uh, phone number at the end of the class so if you have any questions which you want to ask you can put in a whatsapp uh, uh, I'll be able to I think I should be able to uh, answer uh, uh, that question to you so don't, don't worry about this don't don't worry about all these things and uh, just just concentrate on what we are discussing right now because I don't uh, want all of you to make any kind of mistake in what we are discussing right now okay so central radio dense line what I've drawn in the left side is because of calcification of supraspinous and interspinous ligaments which are in the center between the spinous process this is called as dagger sign which is produced so these are the important x-ray signs which are seen in patients with ankylosing spondylitis and ankylosing spondylitis is more commonly seen in males as compared to females okay now the next set of clinical pictures are from a patient who has finger deformities now what is this PIP joint is extended so PIP joint hyperextension plus DIP joint flexion this is uh, 
what is called as phone neck deformity this is called as swan neck deformity and all of you know this yes the second is pip joint flexion along with dip joint extension this is called as boutonniere's deformity so swan neck deformity and boutonniere deformity are finger deformity seen in females with which condition with rheumatoid arthritis so some of the very important points about rheumatoid arthritis before you go into the examination yes it is the most common type of inflammatory arthritis in fact it is a destructive erosive arthritis which is very commonly seen in females as compared to males it is a patient who is zero positive so ra factor positive but the most specific investigation on the bloods is anti ccp antibodies which are very very specific for rheumatoid arthritis <clears throat> most common joint involved in rheumatoid arthritis so please remember most common joint involved in females with rheumatoid arthritis is the metacarpophalangeal joint of which finger index finger metacarpophalangeal joint of the index finger is the most common joint involved in the hands the most common part of spine which gets involved is the which part cervical spine and that too the c1 c2 or atlanto axial joint so these are the important uh, joints which are seen in rheumatoid arthritis and these are the important finger deformities so it is hand stiffness bilaterally symmetrical involvement of the small joints which is what is typically seen in case of these females who develop this zero positive form of inflammatory arthritis which is called as rheumatoid arthritis okay what does this clinical picture show a patient developing redness erythema inflammation around which joint this is the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the foot first mtp joint of the foot problems pain swelling inflammation classically is seen in which condition gout yes or no classically seen in which condition it is gout uh, and gout is a condition which is seen when there is an impaired purine metabolism impaired purine so uric uric acid accumulates in the blood when there is increased uric acid concentration so what de there is deposition of crystals of mono sodium urate monosodium urate crystals get deposit please remember this name monosodium urate for your examinations and while we always tell everybody that it is the first metatar metatarsophalangeal joint which is the most commonly involved joint gout is a systemic presentation it is not always the first mtp joint and this was a question which has been asked in fmg examination the questions can come directly from knee symptoms synovial fluid taken so this is the first thing although the most common joint involved is this it is not always this only belly cheese so if you have any question in the examination from any other joint with the investigation in which the synovial fluid taken from the affected joint when examined under polarized microscope if this shows classical negative birefringence negative negative birefringence because the crystals of monosodium urate will appear needle shaped then this is classically gout 
this is classically gout so negative birefringence needle shaped crystals of monosodium urate under synovial fluid analysis when it is seen under polarized microscope classically is gout classically is gout so please remember and you know the treatment must have read in pharmacology for acute gout treatment of choice NSAIDs and colchicine for chronic gout allo purinol and fibuxostat is the answer as far as the treatment is concerned okay just i have not put the picture here of pseudo gout but if there is a question on knee pain and swelling with synovial fluid showing showing a positive birefringence that is pseudo gout crystals of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate okay now <clears throat> the next set of pictures show changes in the fingers uh, inflammation which is dactylitis of the fingers, destruction or arthritis mutilence of the distal phalanx in the distal interphalangeal joint and an x-ray appearance which is what is called as a pencil in cup appearance. These are the terms which are used for which condition? For a patient who has long-standing psoriasis and develops what is called as psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis. So, I think some students in uh, our thing also asked uh, uh, this uh, uh, questions and send me pictures. So, yes, beta, if you have any clinical picture in hand, you have psoriatic lesions and DIP joint and distal phalangeal involvement do mention psoriatic and consider psoriatic arthritis as one of the very important differential diagnosis. Most common joint involved in psoriatic arthritis is the distal interphalangeal joint of the hand. Basically, it is a problem of DIP joint, destruction of DIP joint, distal phalanx and nail changes is what you see in psoriatic arthritis, long-standing psoriasis. So, that is classical of how psoriatic arthritis would present. Most common joint involved in distal interphalangeal joint. Remember, in rheumatoid arthritis, DIP joints are spared. They are spared. Most common joint they are involved in uh, psoriatic arthritis. And what is the drug of choice for psoriatic arthritis? Is methotrexate. Please remember methotrexate. Okay. The last image from the chapter of arthritis, which I wanted to discuss with all of you. This is a very, very very important examination question. Elderly man sit, uh, standing in front of you with a bilateral genu varus deformity. Isn't it? Bilateral genu varus deformity. Number one, on an x ray, shows a complete collapse of the medial compartment of the knee. So, most common compartment involved is the medial knee compartment what is this suggestive of this is suggestive of osteoarthritis this is suggestive of age related degeneration of the articular cartilage osteoarthritis which manifests as a genu varus deformity because please remember Osteoarthritis of the knee joint is the most common cause of genu varus in adults. Most common cause of genu varus because it is the medial compartment of the knee joint as I have highlighted is involved. So, it is the medial collapse which takes place and the leg drifts towards the midline resulting in a genu varus deformity. Genu varus deformity. So, please remember that uh, very, very important. So, an elderly female or elderly male patient with pain and difficulty in walking with a with such kind of an x-ray in which you see osteophytes, you know, a lot of these, see, you see a lot of these extra bone formation all around. These are called as osteophytes with a collapsed uh, or reduced joint space mainly in the medial side of the knee joint is classically osteoarthritis of the knee. It's classically osteoarthritis and osteoarthritis of the knee joint has been asked in our examination multiple times multiple times okay now we move towards then the next part of our discussion is uh, is uh, we move towards the next part of the discussion which is the topic of pediatric orthopedics so quickly uh, scroll through the important things because i think last examination we had a question on sprengel's deformity 
so some of the important uh, deformities which i want to share and discuss with all of you remember we have spoken about cubitus varus and valgus that depends upon which angle carrying angle we have spoken with you about geno varus and valgus today and just told you the causes the final thing which i wanted to tell you is how to tell whether the hip joint which is called as coxa is in varus or valgus is by determining what is called as neck shaft angle which is the angle between angle between long axis of the femoral neck and long axis of the femoral shaft this is called as neck shaft angle you can remember safely that the normal neck shaft angle is close to 125 degrees that's anatomical if it is less than 120 degrees it's called as coxa varus deformity so just remember if it is less than 120 degrees it's called as coxa varus deformity if it is more than 135 degrees it's called as coxa valgus deformity coxa valgus deformity okay coxa valgus deformity so one such condition in which a young child is born with a reduced neck shaft angle this is called as congenital coxa varus deformity congenital coxa varus so reduced neck shaft angle from the birth is called as congenital coxa vara and these are the children who have restricted restriction in abduction and internal rotation so that's number one clinical feature i will not want to go into details about pediatric orthopedics just that quickly if you see a young child with a reduced neck shaft angle put congenital coxa varus as one of the thoughts in your mind and a congenital coxa vara matlab from the birth there is a reduced neck shaft angle so restriction in abduction and internal rotation and this is all ascribed to why does this happen so they say that this there is a medial part of the neck which is an inverted y shaped defect it is weak here this triangular part due to which this neck actually drifts into varus because of the weakness and this pathological triangle is what is called as fairbanks triangle this pathological triangle which is an inverted y shaped defect which is seen in uh, uh, young children which is a defect in the medial side of the neck is called as fairbanks triangle which is pathological rest of cells which is seen in congenital coxa varus deformity okay yes the second x ray is x ray of the pelvis and you see here in the child the hip joint is out of its socket yes or no so some children are born with a congenitally dislocated hip joint which nowadays is called as ddh or developmental dysplasia of the hip joint developmental dysplasia of the hip joint as what we have discussed in the class also there is dysplasia mainly so in word aya dysplasia of what dysplasia of the acetabulum isn't it dysplasia of the acetabulum due to which the acetabulum is more shallow and is not able to contain the head of the femur so it goes out now this is quite a big topic ddh so i'll not going to discuss into detail about this is just that in young children there are a couple of tests which are do so clinical tests which are employed at birth to see whether the joint is stable or not by the way ddh is more commonly seen in females as compared to males so young females in which there is consanguinity and heredity acetabular dysplasia all they contribute to development of cdh or ddh two important clinical tests which have been described are otolanis test in which we try to reduce an a uh, dislocated joint and second is a barlow's test in which we see whether a joint is so unstable that it can be slightly subluxated out so these are two tests which are done to see stability of a, a hip joint in a newborn child this is very very important for you to remember and uh, uh, <clears throat> 
it is a superior lateral dislocation so you can actually understand just by drawing a line here this is the center and this is one side so the the hip the this head of the femur is up and out it's gone out and that is how the ddh or cdh does take place most common congenital abnormality is the next slide which is seen in the lower extremity is what is called as ctev or club foot deformity ctev or a club foot deformity and uh, ctev means congenital talipus equino varus deformity congenital talipus equino varus it's a three dimensional deformity uh, which is present <laughs> and the deformity components can be remembered by the formula called as cave so key c stands for cavus remember cavus i told you is exaggerated medial longitudinal arch in the foot medial longitudinal arch is that's called as a cavus deformity a stands for adduction adduction is seen in the fourth so cavus is seen in the midfoot adduction is seen in the forefoot v stands for varus varus is seen in the hindfoot at the subtalar joint e stands for equinus equinus is a plantar flex like a horse we have all discussed these things in the class so this is just a quick revision if you have already done this previously so these are the deformity components and along with this the fifth component is internal tibial torsion okay now so i expect all of you to remember these five deformity components of cavus at the midfoot adduction at the forefoot varus and the at the hind foot and equinus at the ankle joint so plantar flex plus internal tibial torsion because after exam what can come all are the deformity components ctv except so that's first thing which all of you can remember that all of the following are deformity components in ctv except that's number one second uh point which i think is is a high yield point for ctv or club foot is how is it treated so the treatment of choice is by manipulation and plaster technique as described by sir juan ignacio ponsetti this is called as ponsetti's treatment so ponsetti's treatment is the treatment of choice now for the management of children with club foot and third and last once the club foot is uh, you know i will not go into surgical details about neglected club foot because i think that will become too much the final thing is once you correct this to maintain the correction after the plasters have been removed you use this splint what is this splint called as this is called as dennis brown splint this is called as dennis brown splint or db splint which is uh, put and you know the child is till the walking age put in this so that the deformity does not recur in the child so dennis brown splint is so these are the three important points which all of you can remember as far as congenital talipus equino varus or club foot is concerned okay now the next uh, deformity which i want to discuss is a congenital deformity in the spine remember as the last one of the last slides or second last maybe i discussed in our workbook some children are born with a congenital defect in an area in a spinal vertebra which is termed as pars inter articularis pars interact so what is pars now i think i explained everybody in the class but yes if you have not if you don't know what is pars inter articularis again look at this now forget about this area which i have mentioned just this is the pedicle of sorry this is the pedicle of a vertebra okay just below the pedicle please focus on this part this is what is called as pars interarticularis it's a connection of pedicle lamina and facets in a vertebra so facet pedicle and lamina they meet at a point which is called as pars at a, a junction and in some children this junction is broken 
from the birth. So as you can see here, a break in the parse. Can all of you appreciate this break in the parse, which renders this vertebra unstable. So it can actually move ahead or translate ahead of the vertebra. This break in the parse interarticularis is a condition which is called as spondylolysis. Spondylolysis. Spondylysis means a break. Spondylolysis. The most common vertebra where this phenomena happens. So this congenital bony defect most commonly is seen in L5 vertebra. So, L5 spondylolysis is most common. Okay? So, this you can remember. And finally, spondylolysis is how do you see. So, now in normally in the spine, we get AP and lateral X-rays. But spondylolysis, you can't diagnose from AP and lateral. So, you get these special X-rays which are called as oblique views of the spine. So, when you get these oblique x-rays in the spine, again, not going into the detail, just remember <coughs> that there are various components of a spinal vertebra, <coughs> sorry, which together form what is called as a Scottish dog appearance. Now, if you want to read, you can read in detail. Without going into detail, just remember that in oblique views of spine, if you want to see whether there is spondylolysis or not. So, if there is in this vertebra, as you can see, there is, if I just magnify, can all of you see the arrows pointing up and down? This shows a break in the area of pars. This is west visible. So, in a Scottish dog appearance, this area is called as a neck. So, oblique views of the spine, if they show a Scottish dog with a broken neck or a collared neck. This is how spondylolysis is described. Spondylolysis is described. Okay. So, this is one of the important uh, congenital problems which can happen as far as uh, spine is concerned. Spondylolysis. Okay. Other few syndromes, I think, lastly, one is uh, this. Some children are born with this kind of picture. So, you can see this young child having a short neck which is webbed. This is what is termed as clipple wheel syndrome. This is called as clipple wheel syndrome. The basic pathology in clipple wheel syndrome is that these are the children who are born with. Congenital fusion of so congenital fusion of the cervical vertebra, congenitally fused cervical vertebra when seen is what is termed as clipple field syndrome, and this presents as a triad of manifestation. So, what are the triad which are seen? One is presence of a short neck. There is stiffness and restriction of movements of the neck. So, congenitally short and stiff neck with restricted movements. And finally, because the neck is stiff in a child, the neck is stiff, the hairline posteriorly it is very, very low. So, presence of low. <clears throat> presence of a low posterior hairline. So, <clears throat> this is congenital short and stiff neck because the cervical vertebra from the birth are fused. They are fused together because there, is a, because there is fusion. The neck is not developed. It is short. It is stiff. There is restricted movements and low posterior hairline. Uh, uh, this is called as a clipple feel syndrome okay now one more uh, entity in uh, <clears throat> develop uh, sorry pediatric orthopedics is wanted to discuss is i think somebody was asking when i was teaching uh, avascular necrosis somebody wrote what is perthes disease so 
this is an x-ray of the pelvis with both hips on the right side here if suppose we consider this as right side see this and please try to understand there are some conditions developmental conditions in which the growing epiphysis so epiphysis matlab secondary center of ossification this is one this is the other because there is ischemia ischemia matlab blood supply not there somehow it gets obstructed results in this ischemic necrosis of the epiphysis this is what is called as generally this is this can happen in any bones in the body but when it happens in the hip joint in this capital femoral epiphysis capital femoral epiphysis this is called as parthes disease parthes disease so beta parthes disease kya hai it is osteo chondrosis now osteochondrosis is a big topic so since most of you may not have actually read osteochondrosis just remember that osteochondrosis simple to understand and remember for your examinations it's actually an aseptic aseptic matlab without infection aseptic ischemic necrosis that is the name which is given to osteochondrosis aseptic ischemic necrosis so when this happens in case of capital femoral epiphysis it is called as parthes disease and parthes disease is normally seen between 4 and 8 years of age so if an 8 or 9 year old boy or child walks with a limp but the limp is not painful it's a painless limp you have to think about osteochondrosis of this capital femoral epiphysis same problem like coxavera there is restriction in abduction and internal rotation the child walks but with a painless limp so this is a what is called as parthes and some books mention this is leg cave and parthes disease because these are three people who had actually discussed and detailed this disease now <coughs> i have not taken osteochondrosis in detail for the fmg students even at missed classes but yes if you want to know there are some very very important named osteochondrosis i don't expect all of you to learn everything this is one this is one of the most commonly seen osteochondrosis aur aapko pata hoga na if you remember what is don't read too much just remember osteochondrosis is aseptic ischemic necrosis of the growing part of the developing part of the bone so for the hip joint parthes for the lunate bone just remember that if you have to learn about the osteochondrosis i think we'll remove this now just we'll concentrate not on parthes but just on the various kinds of osteochondrosis maybe one or two if you can remember osteochondrosis for the lunate bone lunate is the carpal bone in the wrist that is called as keen box disease ठीक है, so osteochondrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis in the hip, Parthes disease for the lunate keen box, and finally one more, osteochondrosis of the tibial tuberosity around the knee joint is what is called as os good Schlatter disease, os good Schlatter disease. i think rest you don't have to remember there are many kinds of osteochondrosis but we will skip it we will remember three for our examinations for the capital femoral epiphysis leg cave and parthes disease or just parthes disease for the lunate in the wrist if there is ischemic necrosis this causes pain to the patient this is called as keen box disease and for the tibial tuberosity where the patellar tendon attaches around the knee joint it's called as os good schlatter's disease os good schlatter's disease okay the last pediatric deformity for uh, this uh, thing round will be what came in the previous examination and uh, in which some children are born with look at this very carefully in which the scapula fails to descend down in each nahi aata it does not come down so scapula fails to descend down so these children are actually born with 
congenital elevated scapula okay that is where we look from behind and see congenitally elevated scapula because the scapula or the shoulder blade does not come down and descend to its normal position as you compare on the right side see this has not come down this is congenitally elevated scapula and this congenital elevation of the scapula is because there is a bar of bone which is between the scapula and the vertebra this is called as omo vertebral bar so this is that bridge or bone which does not allow the scapula to descend down this is called as an omo vertebral bar or the bridge of bone and this condition in which the child has restricted movements at the shoulder as a result of a congenitally elevated scapula this is what is called as sprengel's shoulder or sprengel's deformity sprengel's shoulder or sprengel's deformity this is a question which came i think in the previous fmg examination so the crux from here is that since now <coughs> uh, congenital pediatric orthopedics also started coming i have put in the most important ones and i don't think anything should be asked beyond this from your examinations although there are many kinds of congenital deformities which are there but i think all of you should go ahead with these what we have discussed today as far as your examinations are concerned the last part of discussion today friends and that we'll actually call it a day uh, for your orthopedics thing is uh, some discussion about soft tissue and regional disorders as far as orthopedics is concerned a lot of uh, patients do come to us with a long standing back pain with pain going in the legs with some sensory loss and some kind of numbness and other things and they develop this what is this what is this is called as p i v d or a prolapsed intervertebral disc as all of you can see here this is a prolapsed intervertebral disc between l4 and l5 vertebra yes or no can all of you appreciate this see how big a disc has come out into the canal and it's actually pressing the nerves isn't it so prolapsed intervertebral disc is what you see here now disc prolapse if you see in a uh, axial view can be central paracentral so depending upon ki disc kahan pe aa raha where is it coming it can be central paracentral or far lateral we will not go into detail at this stage in in your preparation just remember most common type of disc prolapse is paracentral disc that is number 1 para central disc and for example this is an mri of a patient who's come to you with back pain and radiating pain in the legs with numbness and possibly motor weakness make it now for example suppose the patient is same patient here l4 l5 para central disc what should i examine the patient will produce symptoms of l4 nerve root compression or l5 nerve root compression and this is a question which has it is there in many books and has been asked many times in neat examination so l4 l5 central paracentral discs tend to press and produce symptoms in the l5 or the nerve which is going down which is called as the traversing route please remember this l4 or the l5 this is the l5 traversing route okay <laughs> now somebody is saying long thoracic nerve palsy but a long thoracic nerve has winging of scapula that is not non descent of scapula it is when the uh, nerve to serratus anterior long thoracic nerve gets paralyzed and when you push because serratus anterior is our major stabilizer of the scapula on the thoracic cage the scapula lifts it's called as winging of scapula that is not uh scapula which is not descended in that this is congenital problem the bachche ke andar scapula has not come down so don't get confused uh between uh, uh this thing okay now the next condition is a soft tissue swelling in a patient around the knee region 
this sometimes because of uh, inflammation of the bursa around the knee so pre patellar bursitis Pre-patellar bursitis is what is called. So, what is a bursa? Bursa is an outpouching of the synovial cavity. It says fluid field. So, it provides smooth movements between the bones and the tendons. So, friction come karte. But sometimes these bursa can get inflamed. Now, again, as I told you in osteochondrosis, there are various important kinds of bursitis. Not that all of you have to read them in detail. Just know the names. Ye sabse important hai. One in front of the patella, patella ke upar, pre-patellar bursitis. This is called as house maid's knee. This is called as house maid's knee. This is important. This is not infection. This is a fluid-filled inflammation of the bursal cavity. This is called as pre-patellar bursitis. This is number one. Some patients develop uh, bursitis just below the patella this is called as infra patellar bursitis infra patellar bursitis and this is called as clergyman's knee this is called as clergyman's knee, infrapatellar bursitis. And finally, I think one more which all of you can remember and which is very commonly seen amongst, you know, uh, children like students who keep on, keep on, keep on, uh, uh, you know, putting the uh, stress on the elbow joint. So, you have presence of olecranon bursitis, which is what is called as student's elbow which is what is called as student's elbow so inflamed bursa can happen in front of the knee which is prepatellar bursitis called as housemaid's knee below the patella this is called as infrapatellar bursitis or clergyman's knee and olecranon bursitis what is called as student's elbow okay the next clinical picture shows <coughs> the hand with two very distinct type of contractures. I covered this in classes also separately. I put two pictures together to you. I told you that I'll come back with image-based session and show you these in contrast. Just concentrate one by one. The first one is a classically a contracture which involves mainly the ring finger. Mainly the ring finger. So this is because, so sometimes in some male patients, there is a contracture because of Involvement of Palmer subcutaneous fascia. Sorry, Palmer subcutaneous fascia contracture, which most commonly affects the ring finger which most commonly affects the ring finger, as all of you can see here. Yes, any guess? What is this called as? This is called as Dupuytren's contracture. This is called as Dupuytren's contracture. It has a hereditary problem and uh, more commonly seen in males, as you can see here. And this is a contracture which develops because of nodular this uh, hypertrophy or contraction in the palmar subcutaneous tissue. This is called as Dupuytren's contraction. It can happen in other places also. But hand and ring fur, you can remember from examination point of view, are the common sites. This is Dupuytren's contracture. This is one. The second type of contracture develops. So this just, this is one. The second type of contracture develops as a sequelae of. So sequelae. of compartment syndrome sequelae of compartment so compartment syndrome i have discussed in detail with all of you that we need a fasciotomy to treat compartment syndrome in case the fasciotomy is not done in time the muscles get dead because blood supply is obstructed and then the dead muscles are replaced by fibrous tissue 
so such kind of contracture is called as Wokeman's ischemic contracture. This is called as VIC, Wokeman's ischemic contracture. So, if suppose you have a question of contracture in the examination, don't get confused and see whether this is just involving a few fingers with the involvement of uh, the palmar subcutaneous tissue or it is as a result of some kind of an incision or scar in the volar aspect and involving the entire wrist in the fingers which is a Wokeman's ischemic contracture okay these are the two important contractures which are seen okay <clears throat> now all of you have heard about this world uh, tennis elbow I think the a very famous cricketer uh, Mr. Sachin Tindulkar uh, had this in the last few years of his uh, cricketing career when he used to wear a brace and a brand and play band and play sorry so but a tennis elbow is a condition in which the common extensor so common extensor is a uh, lateral epicondyle so pain and inflammation of the common extensor pain and inflammation of the common extensor origin tendon <clears throat> that is around the lateral epicondyle it is what is called as tennis elbow it's called as tennis elbow and <laughs> this pain and inflammation in the lateral epicondyle so lateral epicondylitis is this is also what is called as of the various kind of you know <coughs> this is mostly an, uh, you know disuse kind of so overuse of the extensor muscles most commonly there is a degenerative tear in which tendon in the tendon of extensor carpi radialis brevis so please remember this extensor carpi radialis brevis the clinical test which is done to see whether the patient has lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow or not is you ask the patient to forcefully dorsiflex the wrist and you resist it this test is what is called as Cousins test this is called as Cousins test so Cousins test may not come in your examination but just remember that the pain and limitation of movements around the lateral epicondyle or lateral epicondylitis is that of common extensor tendon uh, sheath and origin and this is called as uh, this is because of overuse of these extensor tendons this is called as uh, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow and vice versa as somebody has written pain and inflammation of the medial epicondyle and medial epicondylitis of the common flexor tendon origin is what is called as golfer's elbow golfer's elbow so you must know that uh, uh, you know, tennis elbow and golfer's elbow are uh, inflammation at the extensor and flexor tendon origin. Right, so we come to the last slide for our discussion today. And <clears throat> as I've discussed in the classes, this the extensor tendons in the region of the wrist are arranged in form of various compartments. You must have all read now by now. I hope in terms of anatomy, I'll not go into detail of the various extensor tendon compartments around the wrist the first extensor compartment tendon the first extensor compartment tendons are two and these are the two tendons which also form the lateral boundary of anatomical snuff box abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis so we know by the virtue of anatomy when the tendon moves they move and glide inside a tendon sheath which has fluid sometimes because of overuse the patient has this severe pain in the region of the radial styloid process and that is because of this tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis matlab inflammation of the tendon sheath of the first extensor tendon compartment. This is how it looks like. So severe pain on around the so severe pain around the radial styloid process. 
<coughs> radial styloid process and this tenosynovitis is what is called as D. curvains D. curvains tenosynovitis which is tenosynovitis matlab inflammation of the tendon sheath tenosynovium the tendon sheath which is covering abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis so D. curvains tenosynovitis is a condition in which a patient has severe pain and inflammation around the radial styloid process and this is a very very commonly caused seen condition as a result of overuse of the first extensor compartment tendons right oh thank you guys thank you so much and for all the support and for all of you from the bottom of my heart then and the entire miss team we wish you all the best a very happy new year first of all to you all and your family members as and when it comes day after tomorrow and for your examination on 20th of january not only for orthopedics for the entire subject take rest be patient be relaxed i know all of you have studied very very hard you all will do very well from the bottom of my heart once again and from the entire mist team and management wishing you all the best for your examination so all the best all of you God willing, pass with flying colors. We want to see all of you as doctors with apron and registered medical degree. See you. Bye-bye and take care.